Okay, let me start off by saying that I know dang well that none of you are going to believe me. After all, at this stage in time, the idea of time travel is just barely moving from something which is shunned by the scientific community and the world in general to its infancy of being taken seriously. And you have so many people who LARP as time travelers who truly aren't, even right here on the internet. Heck, the time travel subreddit is full of them. But regardless of whether you believe or not, I assure you that I am a real one. I will say right off the bat that I won't give you my real name, for the simple reason that, well, I'm actually alive right now in 2023. To be more specific, the past version of me is alive right now, and I can't afford to let history change, for reasons I'll go into in a minute. I also won't get into much information about the future in relation to things such as politics or such, so please do not ask. But I suppose I should give a few rather vague details which may help convince you as time goes on that I am telling the truth. It may help convince the right people that my warning is real. For starters, less than two or three decades from now, not only have the cures for cancer and other major diseases been found, but they can be administered from a simple shot. In a way, the pandemic we went through helped accelerate their development. We also end up making death more of a choice than an inevitability. Life extension research being conducted right now leads to both the ability to live for centuries if not longer, but also retain our youthful bodies for as long as you wish, which means many of you reading this might still be alive in my time. I was one of those who jumped on the bandwagon after they had finished working the bugs out of it. I mean, imagine having the body of yourself in your 20s, with all the knowledge and wisdom that you accrue from living so long, not to mention being able to do all the things which a single natural lifetime wouldn't allow. It gets some pushback at first by people who worry about living beyond a natural lifetime. Gasoline is banned by the halfway point of this century, but synthetic fuel means people aren't forced into electric cars, which I was extremely happy about, because it meant that I could keep driving my Cadillac DeVille around. Although many people get hooked on the flying car craze that happens towards the end of the 21st century, not me though. I prefer staying on the ground. Trust me, mid-air accidents are not pretty. However, space travel took off after the Artemis missions put people back on the moon, a few years from now for you guys, and once the moon base and spaceport was constructed well, it was off to the races from there. Vacations to planets like Mars, along with planetary moons such as Europa and Titan, become regular occurrences even for those not so wealthy. And as for time travel, well that took a little while longer than anticipated to actually work on, and that's the reason why I'm writing this now. You see, there were many discussions that happened as people began to take time travel more and more seriously. Not only to the future, which could already be done with a time dilation, but to the past. It almost became as much of a race for every country in the world as the space race in the 60s had been. Everyone wanted to be written into the history books for eternity, as the ones who had finally invented the ability to travel through time itself but people weren't really rushing like they used to, when they only had a century or less to live. Scientists can work much longer, without worrying about retiring or dying. During the first part of this time, I honestly wasn't a part of the endeavors myself. I had more or less turned my life around from the second I realized I would be able to live far longer than I thought I would before. I made something of myself and without getting into too many specific details, as again, I want my identity to remain protected. I will say that I became a best-selling author, an explorer who did everything from climbing Mount Everest on Earth and Olympus Mons on Mars, to using the vast wealth that I made from writing and other business endeavors to create underwater cities, similar in design to how Rapture from the Bioshock video game looked. I was living my best life from the latter half of the 21st century, to the midway point of the 23rd. But there was something that kept pulling away at my mind all throughout it. 
You see, I had done so much, checked so many things off my bucket list, but there was one thing that hadn't happened yet. And if you guessed that, it was that I wanted to time travel, then congratulations, you've just won a trip for two to Europa. Ever since I had been a little child, growing up at the very tail end of the 20th century and the early 21st, I had wanted to visit the past. I wanted to do things such as attend the 9th annual Cannes Film Festival in 1956, to see Jacques Cousteau's The Silent World win the Golden Palm Award, see extinct animals such as the Barbary Lion and the Tasmanian Tiger, and travel across the oceans on the old ocean liners such as the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. For starters, that was how they hooked me into funding much of the research. You see, a venture capitalist whose real name I won't use, but for the sake of telling this, I will call Reynolds, approached me as one of his first big investors. He had heard me mention my desire to time travel during my book tours. Heck, I had actually written an entire book series about it. That's why when he called me that day, I immediately shot straight up in my chair, paying close attention. Son, he said over the video screen on my desk, I've known for a long time now that you want to visit the past. I saw a smile break across his face. Well, what if I told you that we are the ones closest to actually achieving it? And if you're willing to invest a little time and money into my project, then I will allow you to become one of the first to actually travel to the past. I leaned forward in my chair. Well then, I would say that you now have my attention, Mr. Reynolds. From that moment on, I was hooked. I was brought to his laboratory where I was honestly shocked to find that he wasn't lying. They were closer than any of the hundreds of other government or private entities attempting to master it. Even to me, it was extremely complicated to understand, but I'll try and explain what he found in layman's terms. Many scientists right now in this century believe that if you traveled near a black hole, you would experience time dilation. This means one year near the edge of one would mean 80 years or so back on Earth, and it was already proven in 2190, when a space exploration which had left at the beginning of the 21st century came back looking exactly as they had almost a century prior. There is also a theory that black holes could work in reverse, operating as wormholes to both teleport and send people back in time. The issue is, it was found that you would need a particle accelerator almost a billion kilometers long, along with a stable wormhole. Both were almost a complete impossibility, until Reynolds' team came up with a discovery. They were not only able to use a particle accelerator much smaller, but they were also able to create an artificial wormhole, a man-made black hole in their lab. Naturally, many people, myself included, were concerned about this. I asked Reynolds if there were any safeguards to prevent the artificial black hole from rapidly growing on its own. He pointed upwards at the particle accelerator hanging from the ceiling. Victor, my boy, the particle accelerator is over 90 million sensors monitoring the hole, which, if they detect any kind of anomaly or rapid growth of its own volition beyond our parameters, it'll trigger an emergency shutdown which will zap the hole into non-existence. He slapped me on the back. You got nothing to be concerned about. I took him for his word at it. So dumb of myself to simply let it go at that. But I was blinded by how close we were to being able to conquer not only space but time as well. And in the year 2338, we finally attempted our first use of the artificial wormhole to open a portal to the past. Nothing too far back in time, we decided for a dry run to only go as far back as one single year. Everyone, scientists, other investors, even the janitorial staff crowded into the lab's viewing area, anxious to see if the work which had taken trillions of dollars and literal centuries would actually pay off. And it did. And to both our utter shock and amazement, the wormhole opened. Through the glass and through it, we could see something displayed on the other end of it. We saw the lab looking as it had this same time last year. That wasn't what made our jaws drop though. They dropped because we saw ourselves. 
I could see myself being led around the chamber by Reynolds and his team, detailing me on the advancements that we were now seeing the results of. I turned to Reynolds, finding him staring at the sight before us with such a sense of pride and accomplishment. I felt my own grin begin to stretch across my face. It's actually possible, I thought ecstatically in my head. After so many centuries of hoping, it's actually possible. I saw Reynolds turn to me, the man's smile wider than my own if that was possible. Now do you believe me, Victor? he asked. For a moment, there was complete stillness in the viewing area, and then everybody burst into cheers and applause. We began shaking each other's hands and tugging each other, congratulating ourselves on achieving first what no one else had been able to do. Reynolds then told us to keep what we had seen under our hats. There was a scientific convention coming up in a few years where he wanted to reveal to the world our achievement. We were all too giddy and too busy basking in our own glory to stop to think about the implications of such a decision. Things such as safety protocols and proper procedures never crossed our minds. That mistake was not only the first major one, but the worst. I don't think what happened would have if we would have revealed our findings right there and then. We hit a few snags after that. You see, we could easily open up a wormhole to a few years back. Just as easily to a few decades back. Heck, even a century and a half back took a little more energy, but it was doable. So was being able to cross from one end of the wormhole in the present to the past and returning. We created a portable version of the particle accelerator and wormhole, which allowed us to move from the present to the past. Theoretically, you could use the portable pad to keep hopping back in time further and further. However, to return to the present, you needed the main unit. Nobody could find a way to engineer returning into the portable pad. The problem was, the further into the past that you wanted to go, the more energy that was used, and the larger the wormhole had to be to traverse such a long distance. And the particle accelerator began to short out at times, causing us to limit our explorations until repairs could be made. One of the investors, Travis, approached me after a meeting with Reynolds in the spring of 2345 to voice his concerns. What worries me is that if he attempts to open a portal too far back in time at once, it may short out the safeguards, Vic, he said, looking around to make sure that he wasn't overheard. Reynolds had put most of us on edge as of late. If I was fixated on visiting the past, then he was utterly obsessed with it. He never let up on why, but the old photo of him and his mother, someone who had passed centuries ago, gave me a small clue to his motives. But whenever we voiced our concerns now, instead of the placating replies and reassurances, he would snap and almost seem like he was about to hit you. Honestly, I worry about it as well, but I mean, what can we do? I whispered back to him. Nobody besides us knows about how far along we are, and if we even try to mention anything to anybody outside of our group, God only knows what'll do. Especially where the reveal is less than two months away. Travis took a deep breath. I don't care. This is far too dangerous to keep hidden any longer. Somebody has to tell somebody outside. And with that, he turned and walked away. I watched him go unaware that behind me, a tiny remote security bug had been watching us before scampering away. I mulled over his words for about a month and a half, unsure of what to do. Finally, with only a few days until the world reveal, I decided to return to the lab and speak to Reynolds. Unlike the others, the man was still somewhat friendly with me, and I felt still trusting enough to hear me out. I entered the lab using my personal keycard, noting that he wasn't in his office. I could tell that he had been there recently, though. The coffee warmer on his desk still glowed a slightly red, and the cup beside it still had steam rising out of it. So I turned and headed for the observation area. As I drew closer, I heard voices. I couldn't tell whose they were yet, and 
I began to slow as I heard what sounded like angry, almost frantic pleadings from Juan. I froze, feeling a chill run on my spine. Did somebody break into the lab? I looked down, seeing a discarded metal pipe from a recent repair job, and I picked it up. Feeling every muscle in my body begin to tense up. I hit the button to open the pneumatic doors into the observation room and I slid inside. Nobody was in here, but I can now tell the voices were coming from the main room itself. I crouch walked to the glass and slowly peeked over it. What I saw made me nearly drop the pipe. Reynolds stood in the room almost directly under the particle accelerator. Around him were about 10 or 12 of his personal security team. That wasn't the worst sight, though. Oh, oh God. Travis lay on an old medical gurney, the types that you used to see in an old mental hospital from the 20th century. His arms and legs were strapped tightly down, and he struggled to free himself from the restraints. The intercom into the room had been left on, and they could now hear what the voices were saying. Listen, Reynolds, Travis shouted. You don't know what you're doing. The wormhole is too unstable to demonstrate it before a crowd, especially where you want to open it up so far back in time at once. You don't even know what'll happen. For a moment, Reynolds stayed silent and then he began to chuckle. It wasn't a normal laugh, though. It sounded absolutely insane. I've seen quite literally millions of horror movies in my lifetime and heard so many insane and evil laughs. But hearing one for real, it made me shudder. He began to speak back to Travis quietly, too softly for me to hear. But whatever he had said, it made a look of complete horror fall over Travis's face. Oh my God, he moaned out. A feeling of dread began to course through me. Even though I didn't know what Reynolds had told him, I knew that it wasn't good. The man patted Travis on the shoulder and finally said something that I could make out. You'll be the first, Travis. For my own eyes to see before the big reveal. And nothing you, Victor, or anybody else can do was going to stop me. He began to walk towards the exit. Goodbye, Travis, he said and then exited the lab. I knew where he was going now. He was coming to the observation room. And God only knew what he would do if he found me here. There was only a single door out of the room, though. I knew that it was far too late to try and escape through it. The unhinged man was now on his way here and he would see me exiting from it. A rather large air duct with its cover off for repairs caught my eye, and I set down the pipe as I heard voices approach the door. One thing caught my eye before I climbed up into the vent. An object slouched in a canvas bag, and in the few seconds that I had left, I snatched it up, then climbed onto the table in the middle of the room and finally into the vent. I made it just in time as I heard the pneumatic doors open less than a second later, and I saw through the opening Reynolds and his goons step in and up to the glass. A moment later, the lights in the lab began to flicker and weaken. Horror as palpable as I ever felt surged through me. He's turning on the particle accelerator to open the wormhole. Through the glass, I saw Travis struggle in vain to break free. Below me, I heard Reynolds let out a low, evil chuckle, and then he turned to the man to his left. Do it, he said flatly. In response, the man slammed his meaty fist into a red button on the side of the wall, and I had to slap both of my hands over my mouth to keep from screaming. Have you ever heard about something called spaghettification? It's what scientists, both now in this time and in the future, call what happens when... A black hole swallows an object in its path, whether it be a star, a planet, or in this case, a person. The wormhole opened and as it did, Travis began to scream. It was the most pained, agonizing scream that I've heard a human being make. As it did, I saw both him and the gurney begin to get pulled toward the opening black hole. That wasn't the most horrible part though. As he approached it, both he and the gurney seemed to begin to stretch out, and at the same time, compress. As if he was Laffy Taffy being stretched and pulled on a machine. His scream began to sound off, tinny. It rose several octaves. 
They say that if a human being was sucked into a black hole, the process of spaghettification would be one of the most horrific and painful ways to die. I can confidently say that they were understating that hypothesis. It was all over in a span of about 20 seconds for us, but I knew for Travis what had been seconds for us had been an eternity of dying for him due to time dilation. The accelerator was turned off and the black hole wavered for a moment before vanishing. When it was gone, Reynolds turned to his men. Ready the plans and items needed for the world reveal. I want everything to be in place for when it's time, he said. One guard nodded. Yes, sir, we'll have it all ready. The men that I had once considered my partner and friend began to walk towards the door. When the guard called after him, and if Victor should come poking his nose around here while you're gone, he asked. I felt a fresh a surge of fear and horror splash through me as the question was answered. Then end him the same way we did Travis. I will not have him interfering in this. Actually, he held up a finger. Don't do that. Go out after this and find him. Put him in my personal jet and put him in the farthest distance away. He deserves what's coming almost more than anyone else, and I want him to be one of the last to go. And with that, he turned and strode out of the lab. I couldn't help but shake uncontrollably in the cramped metal space at his words, as the guards gathered some papers and equipment, and then left the lab. It took me a long time to climb down from that vent and sneak onto the lab. I was terrified that I would be caught at any moment but I managed to make it out unseen. I didn't go back to my home, any of my homes across the world actually. I knew that there would be men at all of them just waiting for me. Instead, I did something that I hadn't in centuries, and I returned to my poor and tumble roots. I first withdrew all the money and gold that I could from my bank accounts knowing that I would need it, and ended up taking refuge in an extremely run-down motel in the city. One which advertised itself as an authentic early 21st century motel experience. It was for technophobes, people who were afraid or hated technology to stay when needing to go out from their homes. While there, I frantically tried contacting anybody that I could to warn them, especially after discovering a typed, printed out speech, something that I hadn't seen in centuries, stuffed into a pocket of the bag. Most of it related to the reveal speech, but the last part was what caused me to try calling anybody in power in such a panic. Even now, the words of what turned into a twisted manifesto still fill me with such horror I can't describe. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I must end this presentation with a bit of an admission. This device can indeed open a wormhole through time. It can allow humanity to traverse time and space, allow us to move freely to the past and future at will. But that was only a side effect. It was not what I secretly designed this machine for in the first place. You see, humanity to me as it is now is abhorrent. It's disgusting and aberration. It has been ever since I was a child and had my mother and father educate me on how evil the species we were to the environment, to each other, and to the universe as a whole. As they became older and I grew, they passed those views on to me. At first, I didn't understand why they and those like them wanted, and not just humans, but all sapient, sentient life to cease to exist. But as these centuries had gone on, I had come to understand their views. Humans were never meant to live this long, Many of us, both here in the audience and watching at home, were never meant to live as long as we have. We all should have done the right thing and died a long time ago. It's disgusting to let ourselves live on. Every year I kept living was one that I hated. But I know I'll never get the majority of others to agree with my views. Our views. And so in secret, I have worked with them for centuries on a final plan. To make the choice for you... For all of us. None of you deserve to keep living beyond today. None of us either. 
All sapient, sentient life in the universe needs to do the right thing and cease to exist. And none of you deserves to be able to travel through time. This is the moment for humanity for everything to end, and it's too late to escape. May the universe be bettered by the erasure of all life. Goodbye. And now I should probably explain why I'm telling you all of this how I managed to travel back here and why I'm revealing all of these things. It's because I wasn't able to stop Reynolds. I tried desperately for days to get through to anybody in the government to warn them. I left a message after message. But just like the government now with such a mess in the future that either nobody got my messages or they were ignored as a hoax. At least, not until it was far too late to stop. Because on August 17th, 2345, at exactly 2.30 in the afternoon, Reynolds walked on stage in front of millions of people in the audience in the remodeled Los Angeles Convention Center, and with billions more watching all over the world. He revealed his machine, which he had moved to the center from the lab, and did exactly as the prepared speech had gone. The world aghast as it thought it had opened up a new age in humanity's existence, able to not only reach the stars but also the future and past. I watched it on the ancient, barely functioning smart TV in my motel room as I frantically prepared. I saw the moment that he launched into his manifesto speech. I saw the realization begin to spread over the crowd, the looks of excitement and glee melting into existential dread and horror. A few tried to rush him to stop him, but his guards, ones that I realized were also a part of his group, shot them. It didn't matter whether they were men or women. They were shot like rabid animals with no remorse. And then Reynolds pulled the lever. The screens didn't stay up for long, nor did I wait around to watch much, but the little that I did will stay burned into my memory for the rest of my existence. The black hole opened, growing rapidly far more so than I ever saw it do before. It was a runaway black hole, one which might never stop growing. I saw the start of millions of people begin the process of a spaghettification. The screams of pain and agony of millions of lives ending at once. To them, drown out for a literal eternity of horrific stretching and peeling into oblivion. Must be what the deepest pits of this world are filled with sound like. Before the end of the day, Earth was gone, sucked into the ever-expanding black hole. Billions of lives were ended in the most terrific, painful way imaginable, and with no way to even attempt to escape, as all of Earth was inside the event horizon. And for all I know, it kept growing. For all I know, it ate the entire galaxy and it's on its way to swallow the entire universe, ending every sapient, sentient thing in existence. But I don't know. I never saw it. You see, the thing that I grabbed in that canvas bag that day, which sat along with the copy of Reynolds' speech, the thing that I saw which made me snatch it up in the first place, was the portable pad. I guess the maniac never thought again about it, seeing as how he never planned for it to be properly used. And as I witnessed the final few moments of his speech, I frantically typed in a random date, a century before into the wrist-mounted destination selector. I just barely managed to send myself back in time before Los Angeles was obliterated. It's taken me a while to make it all the way back here to 2023. I didn't dare jump more than a few decades back at a time after that first large jump. I was in untested waters and I didn't want to accidentally destabilize the wormhole and end up doing to myself what had been done to everybody else. And I found jumping back can physically drain you. It doesn't cause any adverse effects such as cancer or tumors to grow, thank God, but it does tire you out causing you to sleep for two or three days at a time. And I should explain why I'm here in the first place. First, I have to say, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so sorry that I was so blind, so easily able to be used for my money to have such an evil plan enacted. I am so sorry that whether or not I meant for it to happen, I was a part of what happened. 
I'm so sorry that I was allowed in my pursuit of a centuries-long dream to become a pawn. But I have a plan to try and prevent that horrific, evil act, one which makes all prior human atrocities look like Tonka toys in comparison from happening. It will require a sacrifice from me, however. I do believe it will cost me a piece of myself, a piece of my soul. You see, I won't be able to strike and try to kill Reynolds in his adulthood, due to the wealth and power that he gained from his parents. I already had thought of that when I landed back in the mid-23rd century, which means like all those people here online spoke about wanting to do with some other horrible evil men, dictators if they got their hands on time travel. I must. No, I cannot bring myself to say it outright. Even for the most evil man in existence, I cannot bring myself to outright say what I feel I must do, and the way that I must do it. And I know that it will be one of the hardest things to live with once I've done it, but it must be done. That is why before I do this, I'm making one final jump back from here, to give myself a final chance of happiness and peace for a few decades, almost a century. I'm going to give myself one final gift. I'm going to send myself back to the early 1900s. I'm currently collecting vintage cash and more gold things than I couldn't get in my time anymore to start a new life back then. I'm going to see the Barbary Lion and Tasmanian Tiger and all of the other long extinct animals. I'm going to go to the Cannes Film Festival in 1956 and shake the hand of Jacques Cousteau, see his amazing film win that award. I'm going to take many oceanic crossing trips on the ocean liners, and I'm going to do much more since the life extension and age reversal therapies will last for another 480 years before wearing off. And all the while, I'll be preparing myself mentally, emotionally, and physically for the horrific act which I must do to help keep humanity and to keep everything from ending. So all of you, along with your children, grandchildren, and so on, can live long, happy lives for as long as you want. I already wake up screaming almost every night from the horror that I saw that last day in the 24th century. I know that I likely will scream worse after I do this, but it must be done. I'm only staying here another few weeks just to take in a final look at a time that I had almost forgotten about. So please, wish me luck. As morbid as that might be. I do need to warn you of one thing though, one thing which both worries and scares me far more than any fictional monster or slasher ever could. There is one element of time travel which has been hypothesized but never proven. One that, even after traveling through time, I don't know about. The theory of the multiverse. If someone were to travel back in time and alter the course of history in any large way, it is theorized that instead of the timeline they're unchanging with it, a new, branching timeline would emerge, one where the change occurs, while the other one continues on exactly as it originally did. The person who made the change would never know that they were on the new, branching timeline. They couldn't. I pray to God, one which I still believe in, but so many in my time stopped believing in long ago, that the multiverse theory is wrong. That when I do this, I'll change this universe's fate this timeline. But, if it's right, I'm so, so sorry for what is to come. There's nothing worse than waking up in a cold sweat, ruining a perfectly good night of sleep. If it's night terrors, well, I can't help you there. But if you're just a naturally hot sleeper, then listen up. Ghost Bed is here for you. As the makers of the coolest beds in the world, Ghost Bed is your go-to for cooling mattresses, cooling pillows, and even cooling bedding. From their signature ghost ice fabric to patented technology that adjusts with your body temperature, every Ghost Bed mattress is designed with cooling in mind. So whether you want a plusher mattress that cushions your shoulders and hips, or a firmer option with exceptional support, Ghost Bed will keep you cool and comfortable all night long. For a limited time, Creepscast listeners can get 30% off mattresses, plus get two luxury pillows and other freebies. Just visit ghostbed.com slash creepscast. Use promo code MrCreeps at checkout. That's ghostbed.com slash creepscast. 
with promo code of Mr. Graves. Every morning it's the same thing. People lining up at the pumps that seem to always be full. I've seen fights erupt when somebody cuts line at the pump. And dear God, don't get in the way of them ordering their gallon-sized bucket of coffee to go. With their pseudo-egg wrapped in dough and deep-fried, part of this nutritious breakfast. Every morning it looks like an army of ants on caffeine, running around, grabbing whatever food-type substances and drinks they can, then taking their usual position of impatiently waiting in line. I love the different poses. The watch watcher. They must glance at their watch every two seconds to show you how much they're being inconvenienced. They're usually the ones getting into a Mercedes or a BMW when they leave. I don't know why they don't get their breakfast catered. I'm sure they can afford it. The foot tapper. Usually they have something stuck in their ear and can't hear their order being called. The heavy sire. Exhales loudly every third time the watch watcher checks the time. And when the foot tapper has to be told to move up in line as if anybody could hear him over the music that's blaring so loud over the speakers, making it so easy for everyone. Did I happen to mention that I work here? Sometimes I wonder why after the things I've seen, not just the idiots but other things, much darker things, but we'll get to that. Every morning I have to deal with these idiots. Is it still called road rage if you feel it in a gas station? As much as I hate them, customers are actually the easiest part of my job. I mean, who wouldn't want to go out in the middle of the night when the temperature is below zero and the wind is howling to change the bags and the trash cans because it's the appointed time? And to appointed the time, you ask? Why the manual, of course. The corporate bean counters have done studies and run focus groups or some nonsense to decide the perfect time of day or in this case, night, to empty the trash. It's all in the manual. The manual is your friend. The manual is your god. The manual must be obeyed at all costs. That's what the manual says. So, if it's cleaning the toilets, emptying the trash, or washing out the coffee makers, the manual tells us exactly when and how to do it. That's a load off my mind. I don't even have to worry about not knowing how to clean a toilet. The manual tells me. What it doesn't tell me is what happens when the power goes out only at our station every night at exactly 2.59am and comes back on at 3.01. I've seen this so many times. I watch the McDonald's beside us and their lights never go out. What's even stranger is these security cameras never seem to pick it up. I've reviewed the recordings. No loss of power ever shows. What does happen is some other timestamp on the video suddenly shoots from 2.59 to 3.01. Like those two minutes never existed. The corporate techies call it a glitch and they tell me to ignore it. The rest of us don't mention it. Not if we know what's good for us. But I know why it happens. I don't tell anyone for fear of being sent to... Is it corporate who keeps us shaking in terror at the potential of letting outsiders know what happens during those two missing minutes every night? Yes and no. It's something much closer, much darker. Something that could. I guess the best way to describe it would be to tell the story of Kenny. Now, I know when I first heard his name, I did the famous line from South Park. Oh no, they killed Kenny. It used to make me chuckle. I don't do that anymore. He started working here around five months ago. I mean, wow, has it really been that long? Anyway, he was just another goofy teenager starting his first job after high school. Not that I was an elder scholar or anything. I only started here a year before Kenny did. He was fun to work with and we instantly became buddies. We loved to goof off during the night shift. Most nights, it was just us working together. The place was usually dead from midnight until 5. We would rush around to get all of our chores done, so we had some free time. 
More than once, we got into chicken nugget battles, which would have us cleaning up right before the morning rush help came on. We found it exactly where the cameras could and couldn't see, and we hid from them while we had our battles. We became so good at it that the night security guys would call and ask where we were at. Yep, the corporate bean counters monitored us night and day. Big Brother was always watching. More than once, we discussed the option of tearing down the cameras and visiting corporate headquarters to shove them, while in some very interesting and anatomically uncomfortable areas of management's collective persons. But as for what happened to Kenny, we were having one of our nugget battles when Kenny gave a shout. I went over to see what was wrong and found him holding his cheek. He said something sharp at him. I told him that I was just throwing nuggets when he looked down and saw the offending object. He picked up a nugget that was broken in half, but there was something sticking out of it. We looked and there was what looked like a woman's diamond engagement ring. We debated back and forth how it could have gotten lodged in there when Kenny pulled it out and found the meat perfectly formed around it. I don't think it got stuck in there, Kenny said. I think it was processed this way. That would mean, I said, that someone was accidentally processed in the meat machine. Are we sure that it was an accident? Even as the words came out of my mouth, I knew how ludicrous they sounded. That kind of thing only happened in the movies, didn't it? Kenny's eyes locked on mine and I could tell that he was thinking the same thing. I looked up and saw that we were in the camera's view. Stick that thing in your pocket, quick, I said. Kenny obeyed and we went about cleaning up as usual, but I could tell that it was bothering him. Now forget about that thing, man, I told him. Just some weird coincidence. How many chicken nuggets have you eaten from this place? He said with a haunted look in his eye. I thought for a moment, knowing the answer was much higher than I had wanted it to be. In fact, thinking about the ring and the potential source for the meat to the nuggets, it made me feel ill. It doesn't matter, I won't be eating anymore. What about that poor woman and her family? What about her? I said, my eyes nervously darting toward the nearest camera. Doesn't she deserve more than that? What do you want me to do? Hunt down her family and tell them where we found the ring. Kenny's eyes lit up. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Count me out of that, man, I said, hoping that it would be enough to give him second thoughts about it. He shrugged and went about his cleaning duties, but from that moment on, he had changed. Every time that he was on break, he would be looking things up on his phone. More than once, I glanced over and he was looking at missing person sites and making notes on one that were in the area. The longer he investigated this, the less that he was interested in anything else. I swear it was like he was slowly turning into a zombie. All he did was stare at his phone and make notes. One day I came into the break room and he was just sitting there motionless. His eyes were open but focused on some point off in the distance. It was the creepiest thing that I had ever seen. You okay, Kenny? I said. He slowly turned toward me like some possessed doll. I'm fine. Um, okay. I know who she is. Who who is? The woman whose ring we found. Okay, who is she? She worked at the distribution center. You mean the company's distribution center where we get all of our products from? He nodded slowly. How did you find that out? I asked a lot of questions. Who did you ask? He stared at me with an intensity in his eyes that I had never seen before. People. What people? He turned slowly and looked up at one of the cameras. It's not important, he said looking away from the cameras and resuming his unfocused stare. You okay, man? Yeah, I'm fine. He said in a monotone voice. It's just... I waited for a long moment for him to finish his sentence, but he just sat there like someone had hit his pause button. Just what? I said. He jumped like I had startled him awake. What? What do you mean, what? I said, 
You were talking and just stopped. I did? Yep. What was I saying? Well, that's what I was trying to find out. What? Yep. Yep. No, what? What? I shook my head in frustration. Never mind. I said walking away, leaving him sitting there staring at his face. I couldn't figure if he was messing with me or if something had happened. Had he really been tracking down where that ring came from? Had he really run across some people who had scared him so bad that they turned him into the zombie? I decided that it was time for some answers. After our shift was over, I followed him home. Only he didn't go home. He drove to the distribution center and parked on a secluded spot outside the fence where his car wouldn't be seen. I waited for him to get out of sight before I parked my car and followed him. He stalked through the woods outside the fence for a while until he came to a section that came apart when he pulled on it. He slipped inside and I followed suit after he was out of sight. I came around the corner of a massive building and found him sitting at a picnic bench, smoking a cigarette. I stayed back and watched. Shocked that I had never seen him smoke before. I wondered why he would break in here just to smoke a cigarette. Well, the answer came quickly. The door of the warehouse opened and three people stepped out. I held my breath, thinking that he had been caught, but he was calm and continued to sit at the bench. In fact, the people who had come out began talking to him. He even offered one of them a cigarette. It was then that I realized that they were in the same outfit that he was wearing. The company didn't have different uniforms for those who worked at the stations or those who worked at the distribution center. They chatted for a few minutes and then they all got up and went back inside. Kenny included. It was brilliant. He slipped right inside and no fuss and no moss. I figured, what the heck? It worked for Kenny as I walked up and sat at the same picnic table. I didn't know how long it would be until the next break so I tried a different approach. I knocked on the door. For a few minutes, no one answered. Each time I knocked, I became more anxious that a security guard would show up and arrest me for trespassing. Finally, after knocking, the door opened. I stepped back when I saw a security guard standing there. I hesitated. Well, the large man said in a deep voice. Well, what? Was all that I could think to answer back. Well, are you going to come in or not? It took my brain a moment to comprehend what he had said. Sorry, yes, I said diving through the door. He shut it behind me with a loud bang. It sounded like my doom. I knew that he was onto me. He was just getting me inside so that he could contain me and I couldn't get away. I stood there vapor locked, unable to move for fear of what the guard would do. He stared at me, his eyes boring into mine as though sucking every secret out of me. What do you think you're doing? He said. I, I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. He said, folding his arms in front of his massive chest. No, I promise I don't know anything. I said, hoping my knees wouldn't start knocking. All right, enough of this, he said. I started to shake. I had never been to prison. In fact, I had never gotten in serious trouble in my life. And now here I was, breaking and entering. Even though I didn't really break, I just knocked and entered. I wondered if the judge would take that into account. You've had your break, now get back to work, he said. I stared at him, dumbfounded. Excuse me? You heard me, the company doesn't pay you to stand around. Get back to work. Yes, sir, I said feeling the weight of a prison sentence lift from my shoulders. I took a step and then stopped. Which way is it to where they process the chicken nuggets? The guard rolled his eyes. Freaking newbies, he muttered. Follow the red line. He pointed at the floor where several different colored lines ran down the middle of the hallway and disappeared into the distance. Thanks, I said, quickly following the red line away from him. It led down a long hallway and right up to a large set of double doors that read, 
processing. I looked left and right, but there was no sign of Kenny. I stepped in through the double doors to a huge room full of conveyor belts. I looked around, but it was impossible to tell anybody apart when they were wearing hair nets and face masks. I had made it two steps until I heard, What do you think you're doing? A woman dressed in a white coat accosted me. You know you're not supposed to be on the floor without your hairnet and mask on. She shoved a hairnet on my head and then hooked a mask around my ears. Now where's your station? Um, I said, my eyes darting around as she watched me impatiently. How long have you worked here? She said, seeing my indecision. First day? I lied. She sighed heavily. You're not even supposed to be on the floor yet. You have videos to watch. I shrugged. Wait here, she said. I'll go find somebody to take you upstairs and start your videos. I waited long enough for her to leave the room and then I roamed around trying to find Kenny. I walked past line after line of people sorting through chunks of meat, tossing aside parts that weren't usable, or at least weren't usable for the main product. The bad parts were tossed into plastic bins. As I walked by, I saw some interesting things in the bins. There were little pieces of shiny objects, dark blobs that I couldn't identify, rocks, loose change, and I swear that I saw a finger. As I passed, the people on the line took a second away from their work to shoot me some nasty glances. I guess having someone stare over their shoulder who wasn't a supervisor was taboo. As I walked by, Somebody grabbed me and pulled me over to the line beside me. What the heck are you doing here? Kenny hissed. Looking for you, I said. Okay, you found me, now get out of here. He said, going back to sorting. Not until you tell me what's going on. I said standing beside him and sorting pieces of meat. If I promise to tell you everything later, will you leave? I hesitated. My curiosity had been piqued. What is going on here? I said, tossing a piece of rotten looking meat into a bin. He sighed. Later, we can't talk about it now. I grimaced, knowing that he wouldn't let me in on the secret. I glared at him when suddenly I saw the supervisor coming back and looking for me. Promise me we'll talk about this tonight at work, I said. I promise. I turned around and walked away from him. She saw me and made a beeline for me. What were you doing in the line when you haven't been properly trained? Deciding. Deciding what? That this job isn't for me. I said, handing her my hairnet and mask. I quit. She stared at me, jaw hanging open as I stormed off. I glanced back to see her narrowing her eyes in Kenny's direction. I made my way back out to the hallway and followed the red line back to where I had come into the building. I reached the exit when I heard a familiar deep voice. Decided it's not for you, eh? I turned to see the security guard who had let me in on the way in. That job's not for anyone, I said. Yeah, it's no tiptoe through the tulips. What? It's an old saying, never mind. Why are you going out this way? I suddenly remembered that I was on the wrong side of the building. I figured I would walk around to get some fresh air. He narrowed his eyes at me. I went for broke and I bolted for the door. I could hear him running behind me. Stop. He yelled much closer than I liked. I didn't obey. Instead, I hit the crash bar so hard that I nearly knocked myself backward. The door flung open and smashed against the outside wall. I hit the open air and was around the corner before I knew it. I flew through the brush up to the fence and panicked when I couldn't find the open section right away. He was still in pursuit, but further behind. He must have lost sight of me for a minute. I ran along the fence, pushing on it as I went and growing more desperate with every moment. If I was stuck inside the fence, it would lead me right to the main entrance and I would be caught. I was sweating from running, but also from the thought of going to jail when a section of the fence gave way when I pushed it. 
I breathed a quick sigh of relief as I dove through the open fence to freedom. I ran to my car, not even thinking about the brush that had torn in my uniform and skin. I dove into the car and took off home. Only once I was moving did I look back and see Kenny's car sitting there, partially hidden. I wondered why he was being so secretive. I wondered if I had compromised him by leading them so close to his car. As I drove, my breathing returned to normal, followed by an adrenaline crash. I barely made it home and I fell into bed. When I awoke, it was dark. I jumped up in a panic, not sure where I was until I banked my foot off my nightstand and screamed in pain. Once I could breathe again, I leaned over and turned on the light. It bathed the room in an eerie glow that made me think somebody was there. I looked at the clock and realized that I was late for work. I didn't have time to change, shower, or anything. I just ran out of the door and hopped into my car. The drive to work was a blur. I hoped that I wouldn't get pulled over. When I got there a half hour late, I got an earful from my supervisor about not calling in to tell them that I would be late. I apologized and went about my nightly routine. This isn't the military, he said as he headed out. But if you show up looking like that again, I'll have to write you up. I wasn't sure what he meant until I went to the bathroom and I saw myself. My uniform, it looked like it had been through a shredder. There were tears all over my shirt and pants. My narrow escape through the brush had not been kind. I cringed at the thought of dealing with customers looking like I had spent the night fighting off wild badgers. But in the end, there was nothing that I could do. I would have to get a new uniform to replace this one and use one of my backups. I came out of the bathroom and nearly ran over Kenny. You ready to spill your guts yet? What are you talking about? He said with a blank stare. That's not funny, I said. You promised that you would talk to me tonight. I am talking to you. You're a real comedian and I'll spill it. Spill what? I'm not laughing, Kenny. Talk to me. He looked at me and his eyes glazed over. It scared me. You okay, man? I said. I'm fine. Okay, what do you remember about this warning? His eyes went a deeper glaze as he fell into a thousand yard stare. He didn't say anything for a long moment and then it was like he woke up from a nap and looked at me. I went home and I went to bed. I took a step back from him. No man, you didn't. I didn't. You went to the distribution center. Why would I do that? I tried my best to find any sign that he was joking but I couldn't. And I knew him well enough to tell when he was serious. He was dead serious and believed every word that he was saying. You told me that you had found something out, I said. What? I don't know, you said you would tell me tonight. His eyes lit up with curiosity. Did I tell you? No, I said slowly. I was waiting for you to tell me. Huh, I wonder what it was, he said, his eyes becoming unfocused. Okay, man, you're scaring me. Just then, there came a beep telling me that somebody had ordered food. I gotta get that, I said, staring at him as he stood there like a robot trying to figure out an equation. I ran to the kitchen and started preparing the order. When it was nearly done, I saw Kenny come to the register and ring up the customer. At number 38, I called out, setting the bag of food on the counter. I glanced up and froze when I saw who came for the bag. It was the security guard from the distribution center. So, this is where you really work, he said grabbing the bag. He shot me a sinister smile as he walked out. My fear melted, replaced with anger. I ran out the door after him. Hey, I yelled as he reached for his car door. Yeah? I approached slowly. What did you do to my friend? Who? The cashier. I said pointing inside to Kenny standing there behind the counter looking like a statue. The security guard took a long look at him and then got a scared look in his eye. 
I have to go, he said, ripping his door open and diving inside. What did you do to him? I said, grabbing his car door and holding it open. Get away from me, he said. Tell me first. His eyes darted all around. I can't talk to you, he said barely, opening his lips and staring straight ahead. Why not? His eyes darted up to one of the many security cameras and then back to staring straight ahead. He ripped the door out of my hand, closed it, and roared out of the parking lot. I watched him go, more confused now than ever. I slowly looked around and for the first time realized just how many cameras were aimed at the parking lot. I went back inside and did my job for the rest of the night, trying not to let my eyes drift up to any of the cameras. I kept my eye on Kenny too, watching for any stray glances out of character, anything that would tell me that he was joking. I didn't see one all night. The longer he went, the more scared I became. When our shift was over, I offered to drive him home, but he said that he would be fine and drove off looking like a robot zombie. I wondered if he would make it. I tried to sleep that day, but I couldn't get my mind to shut down. It hadn't been two weeks since Kenny had found that ring and started his quest for the truth. He got out of bed having slept maybe an hour and dragged myself to the bathroom when there was a knock at my door. I answered it and there stood the security guard. Oh, what are you doing here? I said through blurry eyes. Can I come in? I don't know. Are you going to arrest me for trespassing? Should I? I started to close the door. No, I'm going to tell you what happened to your friend. I stopped and reopened the door. He stepped inside, giving the place a quick once over. Okay, so what happened? He asked too many questions. What do you mean? He sighed. I've worked at that place for a while now, and one of the things I've learned is that you don't ask questions. I don't get it. He showed up about a week or so ago. He just blended in and started working on the line. Next thing I know, I'm hearing workers talk about somebody causing trouble. I narrowed it down to your friend and tried to talk some sense into him, but he wasn't having it. The day that you pulled your escape act, they pulled him in and had a discussion with him. And that's what made him go all zombie on me. You don't get it, the guard said. They drugged him. What? They have this drug that they use that slowly eats away at your brain until there's nothing left. Wait, they're killing him. That's the way it works. But why? He looked around the room as if searching for something specific. Do you have an Alexa or any other stuff like that? No, just my phone. And give it to me. I hesitantly handed him my phone and he proceeded to remove the battery. If they find out that I'm telling you this, I'll be next. Telling me what? The chickens. Uh, what about them? They aren't chickens. What are you talking about? They have a system. They drive unmarked white vans out into the streets round up homeless people and take them to the distribution center. Once they have them there, they give them a much more powerful dose of the drug that your friend is on. It kills their brain within hours, and then they process what's left. I stared at him for a long time. So you're saying that the chicken nuggets, they aren't chicken. I ran to the bathroom and vomited in the toilet. When I came back out, he hadn't moved. That can't be real, I said. That's like horror movie stuff. You might be surprised how much stuff you see in movies that's secretly real. So you're saying my friend was poisoned, he nodded. Because he asked too many questions, he nodded again. Then why is he still alive? I don't know, maybe as a warning to you. Me? You were there too, that's how they work. They can get to you anywhere. They can slip it into your food or drink. They can mail you a letter with the drug on it. They can slip it on your car's door handle. It isn't just street people that grab. Protesters, whistleblowers, anybody who threatens their business. 
Do you know how many people disappear in this city every day? No. Well, let's just say they process a whole lot of chicken. What about all those workers? Wouldn't they know that it wasn't chicken? They give them a lower dose, and just enough to keep them from asking questions. I looked around the room. Okay, where is the hidden camera? His eyes darted around. What camera? The one for the reality show or whatever you and Kenny are in on to prank me. You don't believe me. I don't believe you. He hung his head. I stuck my neck out to come warn you. While I appreciate the warning, I said sarcastically. He turned and walked to the door. Just keep an eye out for your friend. He said opening the door and watch for the white vans. He closed it behind him. It was nearly time to go to work. I shook off the thought that was clinging to the back of my brain. What if he was right? I showered and dressed and made it to work on time. The shift was uneventful except for my continual attempts to snap Kenny out of it. He didn't respond. It was just before 3am when I saw a white van pull up. No one got out of it and I couldn't see inside because it had tinted windows. I shrugged it off and went back to work, mopping the kitchen floor. The guard's words came to me as I was doing my chores. I looked back out at the white van, but it was gone. I shrugged and went back to cleaning. A few minutes later, I came out of the back room because someone was yelling. Isn't anybody working around here? An angry man raged at the counter. Sorry, I said. The cashier must be in the bathroom. I took care of him and then went on a mission to find Kenny. In his condition, he could have wandered off somewhere or gotten stuck in a closet. Twenty minutes later, I was frantic. I hadn't seen hide nor hair of Kenny. I was even tempted to check on the roof, but the access ladder was still locked. It was starting to get busy and I didn't have time to search for him anymore. Between cooking and running the register, I was falling behind by the second. I had a lot of irate customers by the time that day shift came in and bailed me out. I was so far behind that I stayed for an extra hour just to help them catch up. After my shift was over, I went to see the supervisor. I'm worried about Kenny, I said. It's not like him to just disappear like that. Well, maybe he got sick and went home without telling you. Maybe, but why is his car still here then? He looked at the security monitors and sure enough, Kenny's car was still sitting in the employee parking. That is weird. I'll tell you what, if he calls in, I'll give you a call. Fair enough, I said yawning. I drove home and fell into a deep sleep. When I woke, I felt more refreshed than I had in days. I went into work that night expecting to find Kenny there laughing at me for falling for such an awesome prank. He wasn't there. Instead, I had somebody from day shift who had volunteered to work overtime. For three days, Kenny didn't show up. On the fourth day, I got a surprise. In the morning, I was making food orders when I called an order number and the guard walked up to take his food. Hey, any sign of Kenny? I said. Sorry, do I know you? He said. Okay, very funny, seriously. I said, leaning closer. Do you think they did something to him? Who did what to who? I looked into his eyes and then let go of his bag of food. He had the same vacant stare that Kenny did just before he had disappeared. Hey, you have a good day now, he said with a smile before walking out. I suddenly felt surrounded and alone at the same time. I glanced up onto the cameras as its mechanical eye stared back at me. I stopped questioning what had happened to Kenny. Deep down, I knew. They towed his car out of the lot. I don't know where it went to. Maybe there's a corporate car crusher for the vehicles of their victims. The worst part is that they continue to get away with it. I wish there was some way that I could prove what I know, but I can't. Without going into the distribution center and getting evidence, I've got nothing. I keep coming to work for some reason. I've started looking for another job. I've written this all down in hopes that someday somebody might be able to use it. 
that they would read this and look in the right place to discover this horrible truth. I've been feeling more tired lately. Maybe it's just knowing about this horrible thing that's happened and having no way to stop it. I wanted to write more of what I remembered in my journal, but my thoughts, they seemed to slip away so easily. It's been a few days since I've written anything, I, I think, or has it been a few weeks? I keep getting thirstier for soda. I'm glad the company lets us have free soda when we work. I keep looking at the cameras for some reason, but I can't remember why. I read the words on the page but don't remember writing them. I see a white van pull up. Oh, it must be a customer. It's nearly three in the morning. I hope they come in before the power surge. Tired of the same old meals week after week? Well, say hello to HelloFresh then, the meal kit delivery service that will revolutionize the way that you eat. With HelloFresh, you'll get access to a constantly rotating menu of chef-curated seasonal recipes that are guaranteed to please even the pickiest of eaters. From classic comfort foods to international cuisine, there's something for every taste and craving. Ingredients are always fresh and pre-portioned, so you can spend less time shopping and more time cooking and enjoying your meals. And with easy-to-follow recipe cards and step-by-step -step instructions, even novice cooks can feel confident in the kitchen. I'm not the best cook either, but recently, my go-to has been the firecracker meatballs, and I absolutely love them. They don't take very long to make, and at the end of the day... I feel better about myself for cooking something up in the kitchen than ordering takeout. To get started today, go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreeps50 and use code MrCreeps50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships for free. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash MrCreeps50, use code MrCreeps50 for 50% off, plus your first box ships for free. Hello Fresh, America's number one meal kit. A man ran down the street, crying, screaming, and zigzagging wildly and looking over his shoulder as he ran. Please, oh God, help me, he said as he ran. And then an inhumanly long arm appeared out of nowhere, grabbing him by the throat and pulling him into an alleyway. The arm was emaciated and sickly looking. Oh my god, my wife said to my right, peering out of the window. Did you see that? That arm had to have been ten feet long. I quickly shut the curtains. Get Sarah, I said, referring to our only child, and go to the basement and grab as many canned foods and bottles of water as you can. I ran upstairs to get my shotgun, and grabbing a couple of boxes of slugs and buckshot and throwing them in a canvas bag. Police and ambulance sirens flew by outside, but I paid them no mind. They wouldn't be able to help much, if at all. We had tried calling a few minutes earlier, but the line had been busy. It was the first time that I had ever heard of 911 and giving a busy signal. As we all settled in the basement, a couple of boxes of food and water next to us on the table. I found an old radio that I kept down here in storage. It was covered in dust, but I blew on it, sending a gray cloud of it into the air. My wife started coughing. I sheepishly apologized, plugging the radio in and turning it on. Civil broadcast from the United States government. A robotic voice stated, as of 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, martial law is being declared for your local area. All emergency services are suspended until further notice. Please stay in your homes and await further instructions. Help is on the way. This is not a test. And then a loud beeping sound issued from the radio, and the message started to repeat. I tried changing the station, but it was coming through on every one. 
Someone started slamming on the door upstairs and I heard the kitchen window directly above us being smashed. Be quiet, I whispered to my wife and daughter. They trembled, pale statues in the darkness of the basement. I heard heavy footsteps above us and the sound of someone dragging something. From further down the street, I heard screaming and wood being smashed, as if someone were kicking in a door. It sounded like a car had driven into the house next door. I heard the shattering glass and rending metal of the car hitting a structure, and then a piercing woman's shriek. The smell of smoke began to permeate the night air. I also heard what sounded like children screaming in our front yard, and a woman who was probably their mother trying to yell instructions at them. Run, she said. Get away from. But then her voice was cut off with a deep gurgling, choking sound. The voices of her children went soon after. I had a small window in the basement and I could see thick gray clouds of smoke outside. It obscured my view of what was going on further down the street. Should we go help them? My wife said. She grabbed my hand reflexively. Her hand felt cold and I could feel their pulse through her skin. I shook my head. Beth, we have our own child to worry about, I said. The radio says that martial law is declared, which means that we have to wait for the military to arrive. I listened for movement upstairs, but nothing else was happening that I could hear. I turned back on the radio. The robotic voice had stopped its monotonous repetition, and now a deep man's voice was speaking. He sounded calm and unhurried. I caught the tail end of what he was saying. The situation is under control, he said. I repeat, the U.S. military has the situation under control. What we ask from you, citizens of our great country, is this. Do not drink the water. Do not shower in the water. Do not cook with the water. Don't even wash your hands with the water. Only drink previously bottled water or other drinks. We believe this outbreak is the result of a localized infection of the town's water supply. An evacuation is in progress. Please stay in your homes and for your safety. Phone calls, text messages, and internet access will be restricted. We will report back when more information is available. The voice ended abruptly, and the robotic voice started speaking again. This is a civil broadcast from the United States government. As of 9.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, martial law. I turned the radio back off. I looked at my wife, and she was terrified. Have any of you drank any of the tap water lately? I asked Sarah and Beth. They all shook their heads in unison. Luckily, all three of us drank a lot of milk and juice. I always cursed how expensive it was having to buy an entire gallon of whole milk and a carton of orange juice every other day. But now I was thanking God for their taste. From the second floor of our house, we heard crashing and smashing, and then a deep voice shouting. It sounded like somebody was dragging a body down the stairs. A woman started crying, and then her voice was cut off. What's going on up there, Daddy? My youngest daughter asked, looking up at me with her big blue eyes. She looked so small and helpless in the dim light of the basement. She was holding a brown stuffed rabbit that I had given her when she was a baby, which she had named Dr. Hoppy. I don't know where he got his medical degree from, but he seemed to be doing a good job of keeping her calm, so I appreciated his bedside manner. Sarah, I said, getting down to my knees so that I was on her level and putting my hand on her shoulder. I think there are sick people all around us, but help is on the way. She held her little rabbit up to me. Is Dr. Hoppy going to get sick too? She asked in a whisper. No, Dr. Hoppy is a doctor. He knows more than we do about staying healthy. I said, smiling at her. And then something started smashing against the basement door, causing all of us to jump. I chambered around into my Benelli, the 12 gauge giving a satisfying ringing noise. I looked up the rickety stairs waiting. 
At this distance, I could easily shoot through the basement door with a slug, but I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a police officer or military personnel, or even just a neighbor looking for help. I wished that I had cameras in the house. But as I was looking up the stairs, something came crashing through the small basement window instead. My wife and daughter jumped, yelling. Get behind me, I said, turning the gun in the direction of the noise. I saw what looked like a toddler still wearing a cartoon character on his clothing, but something was very wrong with his body and face. Tendrils of gray and red roots seemed to grow out of his body, crisscrossing across his skin. One eye cried red as he looked at me, and the other had tiny gray worms crawling out of it. I could still see his pupils though when apparently he could see me, for he began to run forward towards me at a superhuman speed. His mouth was opened, letting blood red vines with spikes shoot out of my direction. Even though I watched the spectacle with open mouthed horror, my instinct still kicked in enough for me to know that I needed to put him down. Without thinking, I fired the shot. Direct hit. He was so small that the exit of the slug blew the entire back of his head off. He fell back as if in slow motion. I saw gray and red tendrils whipping around crazily, moving much faster and more erratically as he passed. Some of them morphed at an increased rate, sending thorns and spikes shooting out, and others wrapped around its body as if trying to protect him from further damage, but it was too late. Within seconds of him laying on the ground, the energy behind the tendrils seemed to weaken. The spikes receded back inside and they began to fall randomly around and on top of his body, no longer moving. A few new smaller tendrils shot out from the wound, but those also quickly lost energy, instead of falling back into what was left of his face. Behind me, Sarah and Beth were still crying. I turned, seeing Sarah burying her face in Dr. Hoppy trying not to look. Beth stared at me with wide, unseeing eyes. She reminded me of pictures that I had seen of shell-shocked soldiers returning from a horrifying war. In all the excitement, I had forgotten about the basement door. I heard metal clattering from the direction of the door and then the lock slowly turned. The door swung open and what I saw there was not another person possessed by the vines like I had expected. A robed man with a bone-like face stared down at me. His hands looked skeletal, almost like deformed claws and his eyes were pure black. He smiled at me, an inhumanly wide grin that showed multiple blood-red tongues flicking in different directions. I have seen you. He said in a voice that sounded like thousands of voices swarming and echoing on top of one another. You will make it, Jason. I will return to you at the end of your journey. You are the only one with the ability to make it out of here. What about my family? I said, tears clouding my vision, pointing at my daughter and wife. The hooded man shrugged. That depends on your actions, he said. It is no concern of mine. My concern is that you make it out. Much relies on your survival, but I do not intercede with mortal affairs much. I only came to give you a warning. What warning? I asked, feeling frantic. Do not trust the man in white. And with that he turned, beginning to walk away slowly. The black robe that he wore rippled and shimmered as if it were made of silk. Wait, what's your name? I asked, but he ignored my question. I looked at my Beth and Sarah who were staring at me open mouthed. Within seconds, the man's footsteps faded into nothing. I think it's time we got out of here, I said to them. I prepare a few backpacks with some food and water. We'll have to split whatever we can carry between the three of us. I need to go get some things from upstairs before we leave, though. I think that we might have a long journey ahead of us. My wife nodded, going through these storage supplies and finding a few bags. I didn't want to leave them alone for even an instant, so I stayed with them while she packed. We gave Sarah a small bag with a few cans of food and water. Sarah also put Dr. Hoppy in it. 
Sorry, Dr. Hoppy, Sarah said, frowning as she zipped up the backpack. I know you don't like small spaces, but it's only for a little while. Beth and I split heavier bags with more food and water, but we didn't overload them, as I had the feeling that we might need to run. After we finished preparing in the basement, we went upstairs. I saw bodies all over our kitchen. I recognized the bodies of our neighbors and a couple of the people from town. They all had gray and red vines sticking out of their skin, unmoving. Some of them had red pouring from both eyes while others had mostly clear faces. Regardless, it looked like the robed man had torn them limb from limb. There were arms with red vines coming out of bones, heads with gray tendrils loosely hanging down from their throats, and other horrors that I don't want to reflect on here. I covered Sarah's eyes as we let her past it all, going upstairs. I found a phone up there, a special model with encryption and VPNs installed that I kept for emergencies. My technologically savvy friend had given it to me, and now I tried turning it on and connecting. I was able to get through some of the government restrictions and connect to a weak internet source. No calls or text messages would go through, however. But I wanted to at least write up my story to let people know what was happening. The government will almost certainly try to cover up what is happening in our town. I plan on getting my family out and letting the world know the truth. However, no matter the cost. I led my family outside to our SUV, keeping the shotgun up and scanning both sides of the front door before they followed me out. I saw endless carnage on the street. Multiple cars had crashed into buildings, garages, and fences. And my neighbor's house was now an inferno of fire that sent out billowing black clouds into the air. Further down the street, I heard explosions. They were coming from the direction of the nearby gas station. I quickly shepherded my wife and daughter to the back seats, slamming the doors and running up front to the driver's seat, laying the shotgun on the passenger seat, pointing towards the door. Backing out of the driveway, I nearly ran over my neighbor. She had hobbled out of the backyard of the burning house, waving her arms at me and shrieking something incomprehensible. Putting down the window, I pulled right up next to her. Mrs. Lucas was a widow who lived alone. Her husband of 40 years had been killed the previous year. He always volunteered to help the poor in the inner city, cooking at soup kitchens and trying to connect the homeless with social services as part of his church community outreach program. One night when he was leaving the soup kitchen, some guy had shot him in the chest and stolen his wallet, while he bled out on the sidewalk. Cameras had caught a fuzzy image of the young man, but he was never identified. Mrs. Lucas had never fully recovered from the death of her husband, but my family and I regularly went over to check on her and spend time with her. Mrs. Lucas, I said putting down my window. She nodded at me, tears brimming in her eyes. My house, she said simply, pointing to the blazing structure of fire behind her. Everything I owned was in there. We need to get out of here, Mrs. Lucas, I said, pointing to the empty passenger seat. My wife and daughter joined in the chorus, saying, Come on, Mrs. Lucas, come with us. She wiped the tears out of her eyes, limping slowly around the car and getting into the seat slowly sighing as she did so. As soon as she slammed the door shut, I pulled off quickly, the tires squealing. I wanted to get as far away from the fires and carnage as I possibly could, if there was anywhere to go. As I drove down the road, the fire of Mrs. Lucas's house getting further and further behind us, a massive explosion rocked the street. A small mushroom cloud of black smoke peaked above the houses further ahead. Oh God, that was the gas station, wasn't it? My wife asked. I looked in the rearview mirror. She was holding my daughter who looked shell-shocked, staring straight ahead without seeing. Yeah, I think so, I agreed. I wanted to avoid that area, so I turned left, taking side streets instead. 
I knew a few ways out of town through a little travel to forest roads. I didn't know if the military would be blocking major thoroughfares, and I really didn't want to find out. I still had hoped that they wouldn't have every small dirt road that wound through fields or forests blocked off, however. As we drove further away from the houses past tobacco fields that extended for acres on both sides of us, Mrs. Lucas started making strange coughing noises. It sounded like she was choking. I looked over and saw her bent over in her seat. I couldn't see her face, but she looked like she was in agony, trying to curl into a fetal position as much as her old body could allow. I pulled the car over quickly, parking in front of a barn. Mrs. Lucas, I said, putting my hand on her shoulder. Please, she said between choking sobs. Water. I ran out of the car, taking the shotgun with me for good measure and opening the back door. My wife quickly passed me a bottle of water and I handed it to Mrs. Lucas. She quickly sat up and started chugging the whole thing rapidly. She didn't look good. Her face was turning a strange yellow color like the Jodens to face of a lifelong alcoholic, and her hands were clenched in a tight fist. I could see small trickles of red where her fingernails bit into her palms. As soon as she had finished the water, she sat there hyperventilating for a moment. I thought that she was crying, but then I realized one of her eyes had a trickle of blood running down from it. She turned to look at me and I saw that her pupils were different sizes one of them fully dilated, and the other a tiny pinpoint. I backed away instinctively. I'm sorry, she said, seeming to regain some control over herself. I don't know what came over me. It must be all the stress of the day. Mrs. Lucas, you didn't drink the tap water, did you? She looked at me sideways. Well, of course I drink the water from my house, young man. She said her other eye beginning to bleed now too. But I filtered it. Don't you know drinking bottled water is bad for the environment? Too much trash in the landfills and the oceans. She shook her head slowly and lazily from side to side as she spoke. Her voice seemed to deepen and gurgle. I looked back at my wife and daughter. Get out of the car, I whispered, a sense of horror overtaking me. But it was too late. A gray, sickly tendril shot out of Miss Lucas's mouth. It began to whip around wildly, my wife and daughter screaming as they felt for the door handles. Miss Lucas's arms began to make strange, snappy noises, lengthening as she raised them towards me. It looked like the bone and joints were being broken and reforming in front of my eyes. Purplish bruises and busting capillaries forming all the way up and down the skin of her arms. Her fingers were turning black, the nails turning blue, as if she were dying or already dead. I backed up out of the car, slowly raising the shotgun. My wife and daughter still weren't out of the car, but I was out of time. Get down! I yelled at them, hoping that they heard me in time, and then I pulled the trigger. The slug blew a hole the size of a grapefruit in Miss Lucas's chest, and then kept going, shattering the passenger side window. Her mouth opened, the jaw disengaging like a snake's as she hissed, spewing a fountain of red towards me. I moved at the last second as the projectile vomit missed my face by mere inches, falling harmlessly in the cornfield behind me. The smell of gunpowder mixed with something else that I had never smelled before. It was a smell like vomit and ammonia mixed together, and it got stronger the closer that I was to the tendrils. A black fluid with iridescent rainbows shimmering in it leaked out of the damaged tendrils around her chest. Tiny worms swarming and writhing in the alien blood as it soaked the seat and floor of the SUV. My ears were ringing from shooting the shotgun, but I could hear the muffled sounds of my wife and daughter still screaming. I pulled open the back door and yanked Sarah out and then gave Beth a hand. Small red tendrils erupted out of Miss Lucas's chest languidly feeling around the windshield and back seat before seeming to run out of energy, falling limply to the floor of the car. Is Miss Lucas all right? Sarah asked in a little voice looking up at me. She had her little pink backpack on. 
My wife kneeled down next to her and whispered something in her ear. It felt like I couldn't talk. I just stood there breathing fast. My vision covered in a white shimmering as waves of adrenaline anxiety overtook me. I did not want to get back into that car. I didn't know how contagious it was, but I remembered the warning on the radio. Don't even wash your hands with the water. Could touching contaminated blood infect me or my family? I didn't know and I didn't want to find out. Come on, I said, grabbing the bags from the back seat and hanging them to my family. We're walking from here. It might be better anyway. The military might be tracking cars by helicopter or satellite. I remembered seeing movies where evil corporations or governments shot anybody who tried to escape a quarantine area, and shivers ran down my spine. Jason, look, my wife said in horror, pointing behind me. I looked at the spot where her trembling finger had pointed. The projectile vomit that Mrs. Lucas had shot before her death had settled into the dirt. A few earthworms writhed on top of the soil, elongating and mutating in front of my eyes. Within seconds, they had grown to a couple feet long, sharp red spikes extruding through their slimy skin. Tiny eyes on stalks were sprouting from the fronts of their bodies at an incredible speed. Dozens of little black orbs that vibrated and searched the surrounding environment. And the new mouths opened beneath the eyes, with teeth as thin as needles poking out from their searching maws. Get back, I said, trying to push my family back from the mutating worms. The worms all responded to the sound of my voice. Raising their heads like snakes who smell prey and a few began slithering in my direction. Run. We all started sprinting down the street. The worms creeped behind us at an unbelievable pace, almost catching up with me even as I sprinted as quickly as I could. As my family and I ran for our lives, I chambered around a buckshot in the shotgun and then turned rapidly and shot at the few worms that were behind us. The spread of the shotgun blast took out all three of them, stopping them instantly. Tendrils a few inches long shot out of their bodies, searching for a moment before falling onto the pavement. I put another round of buckshot in the chamber for good measure, but nothing else moved around us. And then I heard a strange humming coming from further down the road. I turned to my wife. Do you hear that? I asked in a low voice and she nodded. It almost sounds like a Tibetan singing bowl, she said. I looked at her blankly. It's a resonant bowl used for meditation that produces a humming sound. Beth knew all about yoga and meditation. I don't like it, I said. Walking forward slowly, I saw a crowd of people standing around in a circle in a grassy field, all of them with their mouths hanging open, their faces pointing up at the sky. The writhing tendrils of the infection burst out of their skins, endlessly searching in the warm air. Sometimes the tendrils would wrap around one another, and toward the center of the circle, one thick vine sent out from the chest of every monster intertwined. A smell like starter fluid and vomit rose from the group, so pungent that I could almost taste it. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the muzzle of a rifle push into the side of my head. A man dressed in all black was hiding at the edge of the tobacco field. He had used my temporary distraction to gain the advantage over me. Drop the gun slowly, he whispered through his gas mask, and don't make a sound. If you draw those things over here, you and your family will surely die. He spoke calmly, equally, as if he were stating a fact rather than making a threat. I slowly put my hands up, the shotgun loosely held in my right one, and then I tossed it in a patch of grass. It fell with a soft thud. None of the members of the mutated group had noticed the sound, however. Do you see them? The man with the gun whispered to me. They're forming a hive mind. They're exchanging genetic materials. This thing evolves fast. How do you know? I asked and he only chuckled. Come on, he said, lowering his gun. You and your family are to come with me. There is a scientific installation nearby that is still quarantined and secure. 
We are taking the uninfected survivors there until we get new orders. I looked behind me at my family going over to join him. His words struck a chord of anxiety in me. Until we get new orders, but I wasn't sure why. What's your name? I asked the man quietly. And you can just call me X, he said. And I already know yours, Jason. We have been monitoring cameras located all over the town, as well as tracking the movement of vehicles by satellite. The government plans to restore order in this town block by block, and if it can't be done, then this place is going to be wiped off the map. There could be no risk of this thing spreading beyond here. Behind X in the tobacco fields, I saw two more soldiers dressed in all black. They were also wearing gas masks and carrying M4 carbines with sound suppressors screwed in at the ends. X nodded at them and made some sort of hand gesture, and the two other soldiers fell in at both sides of myself and my family. It involved going through the field on the opposite side of the road as the hive of monsters. As we moved, the crunching of our feet in the grass, the only sound besides, that humming coming from the field. I realized that the sky was darkening. Flashes of lightning lit up the horizon. I heard someone screaming from the field across the road. My first thought was that one of the monsters had spotted us and was alerting its fellows as to our presence. All of us whipped around the soldiers raising their weapons, but I quickly realized it was highly unlikely any of the monsters could even see us. We were hidden behind a curve in the tobacco field, looking through some of the plants to observe them, and the rapid darkening of the sky would likely make it even harder to spot our silhouettes. Instead of the monsters looking for others outside their group, two new ones were bringing someone in. I squinted, trying to see harder. The prisoner looked like a skinny young man or maybe a teenager. He had wiry black hair and glasses. He shrieked and fought against his captors the entire way, but they easily overpowered him. The tendrils of the captors had wrapped around his arms and hands like living chains. They otherwise did not touch him, except for a small gray vine that would escape from one of their mouths, caress the hostage's cheeks and forehead, and then disappear back into the host's body. It almost gave me the impression that the hive mind wanted to keep him calm or maybe it was just sampling the goods. As soon as the hostage was within a few feet of the group, the circle scattered, seeming to regain much of their individuality. The prisoner looked around feverishly and then seemed to notice our group. I don't know if it was the glint of some light off one of the rifles or some flash of color from our clothing, but he looked right at us. And then he began screaming, the vines wrapping faster and faster around his legs. Help me, he said trying to point as a gray tendril wrapped around his mouth, gagging him. The monsters in the group noticed his agitation and yelling and also looked over in our direction. I was trying to crouch lower to the ground. The soldiers were feverishly whispering to each other. And then as one member gnawed open a red tendril with his bare teeth, others began running in our direction. I saw the gray tendril wrapped around the hostage's mouth pull away and the one issuing the black fluid it took its place. It forced the young man to drink, wrapping underneath his lips as fluid spurted out of it in an arterial fashion. I nearly gagged just watching it. We have to go, X said to me, the first glint of excitement and bloodlust in his eyes. I stood up quickly, watching Sarah and Beth jog in front of me hand in hand as X led the way. The other two soldiers stayed behind us and... I caught glimpses of them checking our backs multiple times. The monsters were gaining on us, and if we were going much further, I had a feeling that we wouldn't make it, at least not without a gunfight. Those nearest to us out of the group began to run at a superhuman speed. My daughter could not keep up with the soldier, so I picked her up and began to sprint. It was clear that we were not getting away. But then I heard sniper rifles begin shooting from the forest up ahead and I sighed in relief, my heart bursting in my chest from the effort of sprinting while carrying a 40-pound child in a backpack full of supplies. The forest was only 30 or 40 yards away. The soldiers stopped, 
that my wife and I passed by and then began to open fire with the rifles. The gunshots were deafening even though none of them were using full auto bursts. Between the hidden snipers and the three soldiers, they were taking down five or six of the mutated people every few seconds. There was a screaming sound from one of the monsters, like a wailing infant, and the rest of the group immediately stopped and scattered in all directions. A few more shots rang out and a couple more bodies fell across the field, but then everything was quiet. All I could hear was the ringing in my ears and the heavy breathing of my daughter and myself. I got a bottle of water out of my backpack, drinking the whole thing and giving another bottle to her. She just stared at it for a few seconds. Why are we getting out of here? She asked. My wife looked down at her in surprise. Of course we're getting out of here, my wife said. Why would you think otherwise? My daughter pointed to the bodies littering the field. None of those people are getting out of here, Sarah said. I saw the three soldiers entering the forest. X was looking at us with an inscrutable expression. We have a much larger group headed this way, he said to us. Satellite imagery shows that it may have been over around 500 people. Apparently the first phase has ended and the second has begun. What do you mean by first phase? My wife asked him. He shrugged. The chaotic nature of the transformations, some of the mutants ripping others apart, total psychotic breakdowns in predisposed individuals. All of that had kept them disorganized, easy to kill as long as you had weapons. But if they are forming into larger and larger high minds, then that will not continue. It means that our time to get out of here is quickly running out. He started walking forward again, motioning for us to follow. But luckily the scientific installation is only a few hundred yards away. We have time to get there and barricade it if necessary. They may not even know where it is or how to find it. There's nothing out this way, I replied. This is all woods and fields for the next few miles and then you get to the National Park, which is another 20 miles of forest. X shook his head, smiling slightly. You'll see. The other two soldiers didn't talk at all. They looked unhappy and were reloading their guns. We followed X on a deer trail and a few minutes later entered an abandoned barn. He walked directly to the center of it, clearing off ancient looking hay and twigs, and revealed a number pad, where he entered a series of numbers so fast that I couldn't follow the sequence. There was a quiet beeping sound and a round concrete entrance opened up, revealing a ladder that went into a well-lit hallway a story below. We climbed down one by one. My wife, daughter, and I were redirected into a room with a couch and a television. The cable and power down here had apparently never been affected like it was in the rest of the town. I opened up my phone and found that they had open Wi-Fi access down here and began to write up my story. After a few minutes, the soldiers came back, all of them having a sour expression on their faces. The head scientists are MIA for now, X said frowning. We will have to wait. I have no idea where they are or what they're doing. They were supposed to wait here for rescue. Part of my orders are to get them out of here. I nodded to him, handing out peanut butter crackers and water to my family while I finished writing the story on my phone. X didn't seem to notice or care. Across the facility I heard another beeping sound and the faint noise of a door opening. The echo of muffled voices reached out to us across the polished hallways and laboratory rooms. Apparently the wait was over. I saw the soldiers coldly look up at the two scientists in lab coats as they walked into the building. One was a tall man with blonde hair and blue eyes and the other a shorter Asian woman. The man walked up to me extending his hand. Sorry to meet you under such horrible circumstances, he said with a half smile. We're doing everything we can to do with this issue, those monstrosities outside. You are Jason Emery, right? I nodded, not trusting the man at all. Where were you two? I asked. Oh, just taking some samples from the nearby stream, he said. The Asian woman looked away. My name is Dr. Booth and this is Dr. Lau. 
She looked back at us, nodding her head quickly. She looked incredibly uncomfortable to be in the room with us. Are we being evacuated? My wife asked. The doctor looked over at her, narrowing his eyes slightly as if Beth were a fly that he wanted to swat away. And then the charismatic half-smile returned to his face. Of course, he said, his tone one of total confidence. The National Guard, the Army, and the Green Berets are on their way. We are simply trying to evacuate as many of the uninfected to a secure location as possible before undertaking such a large evacuation procedure. But the Air Force is sending countless helicopters as we speak. I saw X and the other two soldiers look away, their faces still cold and emotionless. I had a feeling that I was being fed a line of BS, but to what end? I didn't know. I heard screaming, muffled but distinct, coming from the direction where we had entered the underground laboratory. There were panicked shrieks, gunshots, and slamming noises as I heard the hatchway open with a soft beeping noise. Help us, a male voice cried. They're coming. His words were drowned out in a deep gurgling sound as if he were choking. I couldn't see the hatchway entrance, but I heard a thudding sound as if a body were being dropped down the ladder. The soldiers looked at each other before rising to their feet and running towards the hatchway. What's going on? My wife asked. Just stay here, Dr. Booth said. The military has it under control. It didn't sound like the military had it under control in the slightest. I heard a few male voices screaming and then automatic rifle fire began echoing throughout the tunnels. I heard X yelling, Retreat. I pulled my wife and daughter closer to me on the sofa. Oh, I think we need to get out of here, my wife whispered to me. My daughter had taken Dr. Hoppy, her stuffed rabbit, out of her backpack and was hugging it tightly. Daddy, I don't want to be here anymore, Sarah said to me, looking up at me with her big eyes. I nodded, grabbing both of their hands and rising. We could use the distraction to try to run further in. I heard more and more commotion coming from the hatchway, and then suddenly X tore down the hallway, blood gushing from a huge slice in his forehead. It soaked the entire right side of his face. Dr. Lau and Dr. Booth were in the corner of the room whispering to each other, and I nodded to my wife and daughter pulling them up. We took off down the hallway in the direction that X had gone. Dr. Booth tried yelling something after us, but I ignored him completely. I saw drops of blood in the direction that X had run, like breadcrumbs that would hopefully lead us to the correct path. I couldn't believe how huge this underground laboratory really was. It was like a maze and without the drops of blood to follow, I would have become impossibly lost in minutes. After a few minutes, I saw X up ahead, seeming to slow down significantly. He was limping now, constantly wiping blood out of his face so that he could see. Somewhere along the way, he had lost his rifle. He pulled out his pistol, putting it to his head. Wait, I screamed at him. He looked back at me. It's too late for me, he said. Oh, I'm infected and I can feel it. it. Feels horrible, like something's grabbing my heart and squeezing it. He coughed up a wad of bloody phlegm, spitting it on the floor before wiping his mouth quickly. His other eye had started to bleed, but he still stared through the trickle of blood at me as he put the gun to his temple and he pulled the trigger. He fell as if in slow motion, his remnants spraying the white painted walls of the hallway. I heard footsteps running behind me and saw Dr. Booth coming up. Dang it, he wasn't supposed to die, Dr. Booth said. I sprinted ahead to the corpse of X, grabbing the pistol out of his hand. The words of the black-robed man who had come into my house at the beginning of all this rang in my head. Do not trust the man in white. I turned around to raise the pistol towards him, but he was one step ahead of me. He had already grabbed my daughter, and he had a small revolver that he was holding up to her head. He must have had it in a hidden holster. How about you drop that gun before I do what I want to do to her, the doctor said, smiling like a skeleton. His charismatic persona was gone now, and the monster underneath had been revealed. 
his eyes that looked as dark as black holes. If you kill her, I'll kill you, I said, raising the gun at him. I wasn't giving up the only leverage that I still had here. My wife was standing a few feet next to him, her eyes haunted and shell-shot. My daughter stood there like a mannequin just looking down at her shoes. I wondered what kind of psychological trauma she would have to live with after all this was over, if we survived. Why don't you tell us what this all is about? I don't believe that you had nothing to do with it. He laughed uproariously, but his eyes didn't laugh. He stayed dark and flat. You're not a dumb man, he said. I'm surprised you didn't figure it out earlier. I'm the one who released the pathogen into the town's water supply. But why? I asked. Why would you want to do that to an entire town? What? Kill them? He repeated. I never wanted to kill anyone. Though surely to make an omelet, you need to crack a few eggs. I think that we all know that. We had originally found the alien fungus, if you even call it a fungus, in a meteorite that landed in Antarctica. It appears in the world where this organism evolved. The differences between fungi, plants, and animals are not as distinctive as on Earth. On its own, the fungi can move, breathe, and even hunt small animals. But more interestingly, this fungi also has the ability to overtake any animal life and create a hive mind out of them. They also take memories and skills from the individual members of the group and use it for further into the hive. In our early experiments, we found that certain leaders of the hive mind, the soldiers and kings and queens, produce a substance that reverses cancer, injuries, even death, and other members of the hive. We call it the royal jelly, just like in bee colonies, but this is far more monumental of a discovery. If we allow the fungus to reproduce among large groups of humans and reach its natural state, we can find the alpha organisms among the hive, harvest the royal jelly, and use it to reverse aging, heart disease, cancer, and countless other diseases. Can you imagine the potential scientific value such a discovery would have? It could potentially keep people alive forever, at least those with value to the world. And how do you know that it wouldn't just turn the patient into one of those things? I asked. How do you know this royal jelly doesn't just make you a slave to the hive mind? He shrugged. It never did in animal studies, the doctor said. Now that you understand, why don't we both put down the guns? You realize that with this kind of scientific advance, your daughter could live for centuries. Just one more question, I asked. Did the U.S. government know you released this alien fungus into the water supply? He laughed at this. The U.S. government is too slow and fat to move quickly, Dr. Booth said. They gave me funding for animal studies, but no, I took it upon myself. That was the last thing that I heard him say. At that point, my wife quietly came up from behind him. She yanked his gun back with all of her strength in her right hand, while slamming an open folding knife into his eye with her left hand. The shock and pain made him fire a single round, but it went high into the top of the wall. My daughter screamed, falling to the floor and crawling towards me. Daddy, she said, and I ran up to her, scooping her up and checking her for injuries. She seemed totally unharmed other than some scrapes and bruises. The doctor was screaming something, it sounded like, You! But with all the blood running into his mouth, it was almost incomprehensible. My wife had taken his gun and pointed it at the back of his head. Should we kill him? She asked. I shook my head. You should take Sarah and go forward, I said. I'll take care of him. As they walked forward, I took the pistol that I had gotten from the body of X and raised it, pointing directly at the center of the doctor's head. He was blubbering and shrieking, but in his final moments, a certain clarity came over his one good eye. He stared at me with hatred as I fired, blowing it open and covering the ceiling with what was left of him. Even a little bit of it splashed back on me, tiny droplets that scattered over my mouth and face. As I looked around at the mess, everything that had gone on, I had a totally absurd thought. 
Wow, someone's going to have a heck of a time trying to clean this up. I thought to myself, laughing like a maniac. We wandered through the hallways for hours before accidentally stumbling upon Dr. Lau in a room. She was sitting in the corner drinking a cup of tea. She looked up surprised. As she took in the three of us, covered in blood and scratches, she frowned. Is he dead? She asked simply. I nodded and she sighed. Oh, thank God, he was a lunatic, Dr. Booth. I was afraid of him. I always thought that he would try to make me into one of those things without telling me. Maybe putting a drop of it into my tea or something. He became so obsessed with seeding the fungus into larger and larger animals that I knew it was only a matter of time before he tried infecting humans. I had no idea that he would do it to a whole town now. She stopped and sipped some more from the green tea. Do you know a way out of here? I asked, holding my daughter close to my side. She nodded. You know, he was going to take you and your family as subjects, she said, purposely infest your whole family. I nodded at that, thinking back to the warning of the black-robed man. And yes, there's a way out that leads to the middle of the forest. I'll take you there, but I'm not going with you. I'm staying down here until the reinforcements arrive, if they ever do. We followed her through the labyrinth of halls and rooms until we reached a ladder at the end of one hall. At the top was a hatch. The code is 339. Good luck. She turned and went back in the direction that she had come from. I climbed through it, helping my daughter and wife out. We looked around and saw a seemingly endless forest. Luckily, I had grown up around here and I knew a lot of these woods like the back of my hand. I knew that we were in a state park that bordered the tobacco fields at the north of town and that the park had trails extending to the surrounding towns. It was only a matter of time before finding one of the right ones. We hiked for miles, eventually coming to a clearing. In it, I saw another circle of mutated humans, their tendrils intertwined in the middle. Beneath it, I saw the corpses of Axe, half of his face missing. They allowed drops of some black liquid to fall into his open mouth and he began to stir. Tendrils shot out of his shattered face, sewing up the hole and leaving a writhing mass of stubby gray spikes in its place. In low grunts, he pointed to various directions. The tallest and strongest members of the group ran in those directions. I heard sniper rifles firing and then men screaming, and within minutes, everything was silent. I thought to myself that this must be the royal jelly that the doctor was so obsessed with. It appeared that it could even bring back certain infected individuals from the dead. The hive mind still gathered and I wondered if they would use the knowledge taken from Axe and the other soldiers to break any military quarantine and expand beyond the borders of this destroyed town. As I thought about this, I saw all the members of the circle moving their heads up in unison. They turned their faces up to the sky, their mouths open, as a soft rain began to fall. I recently graduated from a CDL school and decided to get a job relating to my field. After applying to every job that involved driving larger vehicles that I could find, I got a reply about an hour later for a bus driver position at Fredrickson High School. The message read, Hello George, we have reviewed your application and have decided that you would be perfect for our position. Your first day will start tomorrow. Your bus's number is 458, and it is located at a bus yard on 207 Riverside Street. You can arrive at the bus yard at any time, but please arrive at the school before 4 a.m. This is when these students get dismissed. Once these students enter the bus, you can deliver them to their five stops on Old Military Road. Ernest Fredrickson, Principal of Fredrickson High School. I was a bit confused on why there was no interview, but nevertheless, I took the job anyway. Not wanting to look at what I thought was a gifted horse in the mouth. I also thought that it was weird that these school hours took place during the night. 
but I assumed that the school operated at 24 hours a day. Dividing students and teachers into four groups for each shift to follow uh, social distancing guidelines or just for efficiency in general. At around 3.15 a.m., I got into my rusty 1974 Ford F-250 and drove to the address listed in the message. It wasn't that far away, about a 15-minute drive. I arrived at a vehicle gate next to a guard shack. The bus yard consisted of a flat slab of dirt with several buses parked at the back, with a large space in the front to allow for maneuvering the buses into the spots. Surrounding the yard was a fence, with the aforementioned gate and shack replacing a part of the fence. The guard in the shack was startled by my arrival, and proceeded to open the window slightly. Who, who are you? He asked. Uh, hello? I replied. I'm George Redwood. I'm here for bus 458. Are you okay? He picked up a piece of paper, looking at it briefly before putting it down. He then passed me a key I presumed was for my bus. Okay, sir, here's your key. Uh, find your bus and, and replace its parking spot with your truck. Then you can go. The gate then opened and I did as he had asked. I drove my truck through the gate, got out to find my bus and then drove my bus to the front of the yard and I parked it in a corner. I then walked back to my truck and parked it in my bus's original spot, before going back to my bus and driving it back to the gate. My bus was one of those buses with the flat front, the engine in the back, and it had the driver in front of the front wheels. I don't know what the official name of this design is. I noticed that the bus I was given had many dents and scratches, mostly on the front bumper. But I didn't think much of it and I started my shift anyway. I arrived at the school at 3.47am. I noticed that there was only one bus for the school, that being mine. This school was very small so it made sense why there was only one bus. While I waited for the students to be dismissed, I found a list of rules along with a map in the gap between the steering wheel and the windshield. Rules for Fredericks and High School Busing You must follow these rules in driving on old military road. We cannot ensure your safety if you break any of these rules. 1. Do not use any electronic devices for navigation. They will try to deceive you. We printed out a map for you to follow. 2. The bus stops that you can drop kids off at are labeled as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. These stops resemble a bench with three walls with a roof, with the opening being in the front. The bus stop's number will be on both sides of all three walls. If you stop at a bus stop that is not one of the above, leave the stop immediately and continue your journey. Try not to look at anything nearby a fake stop, besides checking a wall to see if it's a valid stop. 3. The road is supposed to be very old, windy, and unmaintained. If the road suddenly changes to a straight road that appears to be newly paved, and the scenery starts repeating, immediately slam on the brakes and turn around before it's too late. Once the road starts curving again, and the straight part is no longer visible. You can turn around and continue your journey. If turning around is not possible, shift the bus into reverse and drive until you either find a place to turn around or the road returns to normal. 4. If the road reaches a dead end, turn around or reverse until the end of the road is no longer visible, similar to Rule 3. 5. If the road merges with another road, remember which side you came from. This will be important if you have to turn around. Do not drive on the road that you did not come from. 6. If any other vehicles appear in the road, disable them by any means possible. I don't care about minor damage to the bus. You can easily bash through any cars or light trucks but be careful around larger vehicles that could put up a fight. Do not drop off any students if your bus is currently being perused by any vehicles.
or you disabled one recently and it crashed in your bus stop. 7. If your bus gets stuck for whatever reason, alert the students and they'll know what to do. There is a handgun in the glove compartment near the steering wheel. Use it to defend the bus if they attempt to get in. Wait in the bus until dawn, and then contact us to get you out of there. No pay will be deducted if this happens. 8. If you hear a church bell, avoid going towards the source. If it's behind you, you're good. If it's on your side or in front of you, turn around and get as far away as you can until the ringing stops. Once you can no longer hear the bell, you can turn around and continue your journey. This usually doesn't last long. 9. If you see a creature on your right running parallel to your bus, do not, under any circumstances, open any doors or windows. While it will always run at the speed of your bus, you can confuse it by constantly accelerating and decelerating. Doing that may allow you to get into a position in which you can run it over. This is the only known way to stop it. 10. If the engine stops for seemingly no reason, immediately start it up again and floor it. Do not look at what is behind the bus. If that doesn't work, refer to Rule 7 for everyone's safety. 11. If you see a human on the road, run it over, even if it resembles a loved one. It's not a human. If you fail to run it over, skip any remaining stops and return to the bus yard as quickly as possible. Do not, under any circumstances, open any doors or windows. If you have to turn around for whatever reason, do so as quickly as possible despite the fact that you likely won't see it again. It is still following you. Once you arrive at the bus yard, alert the guard. They'll know what to do. 12. If you see a mansion in the distance, turn off all lights and floor it. None of our students live here. Its position on the road changes often, sometimes not appearing at all. The owners are deaf, but they can still see the part of the road directly in front of the mansion is straight, and you can turn your lights back on once you're surrounded by forest again, so you'll be fine. This mansion is at least twice as tall as the forest, and it emits light from the room so if you pay attention, you can spot it from far enough away that you can turn off your high beams and headlights before they notice the light. If you see a ridiculously bright light behind you, they saw you. If this happens, put on the modified sunglasses in the glove compartment and get out of there as quickly as you can. The students are prepared with similar sunglasses to prevent being blinded by this light, so don't worry about them. If you are forced to turn around for whatever reason, do so as quickly as possible. Do not drop any students off when the owners are chasing you, and return to the bus yard if necessary. When the light disappears and you've lost them, you can continue your journey. Keep all doors and windows closed during this time. 13. The true end of this road merges with a larger road and a three-way stop. If any students are still on the bus once you've passed all five stops, go back to the front of the road and try again. Keep doing this until all students have reached their stops, or if you get too tired to continue. I was very confused on what to think of this. Sure, it sounds impossible, but as a longtime lurker of this subreddit, I know that I should take these rules seriously. Nevertheless, I continue waiting for the students to be dismissed and I came up with a plan. I will follow the rules unless they could potentially harm someone if they are fake, such as the vehicle ramming. If I can prove a rule to be true without breaking any of them, I will assume that they are all real and I'll follow them all. At 4 a.m., these students exited the school and got on my bus. I estimated that 20 students entered the bus, about 80% capacity under the social distancing guidelines. And despite the situation, most of the students were very chill, as if they had been going to the school for so long that this didn't scare them anymore. Once all the students had entered the bus, I closed the door and I got on the road. 
The road was a two-lane, winding road through a forest, though it was paved. It looked like it hadn't been maintained for decades, with the potholes poorly patched with tar. The pothole fillings looked like chunks of the first world Lightning McQueen paved in cars. Roads like this are nothing unusual here in upstate New York. The first 10 minutes were uneventful, and I dropped off three students at stop on with no complications. That was until I heard a student scream. They're here! I looked in the left mirror and sure enough, I saw a pair of headlights in the distance. Rule number six, if any other vehicles appear in the road, disable them by any means possible. I accelerated the bus, but the pair of headlights accelerated faster. It caught up to me in a matter of seconds and it started tailgating me. It got so close that the headlights were no longer visible from the rear window, but I still knew it was back there. Oh, what is happening? I yelled to the students, even though I knew exactly what was going on. I was still hoping that this was all a joke. Several students replied at once, but I couldn't decipher what any of them were saying. Should I brake check the vehicle? Every student replied, yes, and so I did. I slammed on the brakes, causing my bus to come to a halt within seconds. I heard tires screeching coming from both vehicles shortly followed by a loud crunch from the back of the bus. I then accelerated the bus, looking out the rear window to see the vehicle behind me had stopped chasing me. A collision at that speed must have broken something important under the hood, as we were going 60 plus at the time of the collision. About a minute later, I arrived at stop two. Two students got up, a boy and a girl. So, I assumed I was far enough away from the other vehicle to drop them off. I opened the doors and they were about to step off until we noticed our mistake. That wasn't stop two. It was stop Z. Rule number two. The bus stops that you can drop kids off at are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. If you stop at a bus stop that is not one of the above, leave the stop immediately and continue your journey. I immediately sped off, closing the doors while the bus was already moving. The two students were still at the front of the bus, grabbing the railing to avoid falling due to the dramatic acceleration. Not even a second after I had closed the doors, I heard a demonic screeching from my right. Driver luck! One of the students yelled. She was pointing at the doors, revealing that something had managed to get a part of itself wedged between the doors. As I had to focus on the road, I didn't have much time to look at it, but I was still able to catch a glimpse of whatever she was pointing at. It looked like an arm of a massive gingerbread man, except it reflected no light. I could hear whatever that arm was attached to being dragged across the asphalt, sounding like a mix of wood and metal. I briefly opened the doors, causing the creature to lose its grip and fall to the ground. What the heck was that? I asked the students who were still on the staircase. I don't know, replied the female student. I've seen that thing a few times. The fake bus stop is fairly uncommon. It usually happens at least once a month. But the creatures usually don't get to the bus in time anyway. The male student returned to his seat. This event somehow made me come up with a question for the female student. Actually, how long have you been here? I have lived here since I was a baby. Every house here has its own set of weird rules, but it's all my family could afford. So we've been living together ever since. Oh, and what's your name? She added. George, and you? Angela. Oh, okay. Would you mind staying up here so we can... This is the police. Stop your vehicle immediately. A masculine voice yelled through a megaphone. The voice sounded like a pathetic attempt to be a human. It sounded like the sentence was put through a text-to-speech software and blasted out of a megaphone. I was so into my conversation with Angela that I was completely oblivious to the police cruiser in the left lane. The other students were also distracted by us, so they were unable to warn me like they did last time. 
I slowed down my bus, causing the cruiser to start passing me, intending to do a pit maneuver once it was in position. But what I saw in the cab will haunt me forever. The two creatures inside were vaguely humanoid, enough for them to operate a motor vehicle designed for humans. They looked like the creature from Venom, but covered in bluish-black scales, as if they were reptiles. The one in the passenger seat turned its head 90 degrees to look at me, without moving anything below its neck. Its eyes were thin, vertical lines, stretching from the top of the mouth to the top of the forehead, like the eyes of these stick people from the Henry Stickman collection, except they admitted a white light for them, like Carol Bryan from Minecraft. The two of us stared at each other for what felt like forever. I was not concerned about the fact that I wasn't paying attention to the road. I somehow completely forgot I was driving a bus. I even forgot that I existed altogether. The entire concept of anything I was looking at vanished from my mind, as if I was in the latest stages of dementia. All I knew was the bright light emitting from the creature's eyes. After an unmeasurable amount of time, we broke eye contact with the cruiser and got stuck between a rock and a school bus. I immediately regained the concept of existence and realized what was going on. The bus had been going in a straight line, but the road wasn't straight, and the bus had been veering into the left lane this whole time, until the bus was pushing the cruiser against the cliff on the left. This caused the cruiser to come to a halt almost instantly. I immediately got back into my lane to avoid meeting a similar fate to the cruiser. You're finally back! Angela screamed inches from my face. She got down and cried on the floor while repeating the same sentence multiple times through sobs. How long was I staring at that thing? I asked her. She just cried harder. Oh, okay. I said awkwardly. Um, there's a tissue box between the dashboard and the windshield. You should probably take off your mask until you're done crying. I wanted to comfort her, but I had no idea what I was supposed to do in this situation. So I just let her cry on the floor while resting against my right leg. This usually works for me when I'm having a breakdown, but I have no idea how neurotypical brains work, or if Angela is neurotypical in the first place. Less than a minute after the crash, I arrived at stop number three. Two students got up to exit, so Angela got out of the way so they could get off at the stop and begin their trek down the ominous path beside it. As I left the stop, Angela answered my question from earlier. You were looking at that thing for like five minutes, she said, and you were so stiff that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't access the brakes. I could barely move the steering wheel. At least your foot wasn't on the... Uh, the diesel? I laughed. I just call it the accelerator. Which is stupider. Calling a liquid fuel gas or calling the accelerator the gas. I guess we should pay attention to what's going on around us so something doesn't sneak up on us like last time. Uh, good idea. Well, I'm going back to my seat so I don't get yeeted through the windshield. But if you need any help or have any more questions for me... Just call me and I'll come right back up here. All right. Minutes later, I heard clunking noises from the back of the bus. Before any of us could comprehend what was going on, the engine stopped. Rule 10. If the engine stops for seemingly no reason, immediately start it up again and floor it. Do not look at what is behind the bus. If that doesn't work, refer to Rule 7 for everyone's safety. I desperately tried to start the engine, but it was no use. The bus was still gliding down the road because of inertia, but I could barely move the steering wheel. Power steering was disabled when the engine turned off. The road was still relatively straight, enough for me to stay on the road with my very limited steering. But if I encountered a curve, I would have to stop the bus and execute Rule 7. The rules implied something behind the bus and managed to turn off the engine. And that's when I noticed a pair of headlights suddenly appeared behind me. The unseen vehicle went into the left lane, 
and accelerated until it was beside me. It was the cruiser from earlier. Those guys had turned off their lights and followed my taillights to navigate the road. I immediately stopped looking at it to avoid it being hypnotized again. After holding down the starter for about 10 seconds, the engine finally came back to life and I floored it. The cruiser noticed this and accelerated. Now that I've got my powered steering back, I blindly swerved into the left lane while staring directly ahead. I heard a loud crunch from my left. I looked into my left mirror and saw that the cruiser was no longer following me. The entire chassis was bent with the corner of my bus collided with the back right door. The things attempted to hypnotize me through the mirror, but they were too far away at this point to affect me. Seconds after the crash, I saw stop 4 on the right, but skipped it because the cruiser was way too close to it. The hill was still on the left, but the area on the right was flat enough to fit a few houses. These houses were fairly large, probably about 2,500 square feet on the top two floors, and an unknown amount of space underground if they had basements. I remember stop 1 and 3 didn't have any houses visible from the bus stop, so this was the first time I got to see the houses. As I passed the houses, I decided to ask a few questions to the residents. Can someone who lives at stop 4 come up here for a moment? I have questions about the houses. A boy from the seat behind me came up. How much does it actually cost to live here? I... But before I could say anything else, I saw an old man with a cane slowly cross the road. Rule 11. If you see a human on the road, run it over, even if it resembles a loved one. It is not a human. I already had enough faith in the rules at this point to know that it was not a human. But the screeching he made when I ran him over further enforced it. After a short pause, the boy answered my question. Uh, 50 bucks a month, for me at least. And yes, we have rules just as weird and terrifying as the ones in here. Oh, wow. It's not as much of a bargain as it sounds. Anyone who lives here is either extremely poor or is oblivious to what they are getting themselves into. Most of the cost is paid with the mental and sometimes physical trauma that comes with living here. Yeah, I've heard the stories about places like this. and Definitely not worth it. I doubt you could report any of this to the police or some other authority. My family actually did have to call 911 once. We told the operator that some dude with a gun was in our house. Nobody believes the officers that showed up in Forest Fred, the creature that terrorizes the residents at Stop 4, to retreat back to the forest. Maybe we could tell you our story sometime. Yeah, maybe. I'm going back to my seat now. Uh, name's Tommy, by the way. Nice meeting you, Tommy. I would like to hear your stories about your life here sometime. And Tommy was about to return to his seat when he noticed something. Oh crap, rule nine, he yelled. Rule nine. If you see a creature on your right running parallel to your bus, do not, under any circumstances, open any doors or windows. While it will always run at the speed of your bus... You can confuse it by constantly accelerating and decelerating. Doing that may allow you to get into a position in which you can run it over. This is the only known way to stop it. I looked to the right and I saw it. Running beside the bus doors was a creature running on all fours. It was like a brute version of the creatures in the cruiser. Its arms and legs were nearly identical, and it was running like a horse. The bus was going 40 miles per hour at this point, a very appropriate speed for this road. I sped up, but so did it. And Tommy quickly ran back to his seat as the bus was starting to become unstable as I drove way too fast for this road. Now at over 80 miles per hour, the thing was still beside the door, and it had been since I had spotted it. I slowed down, but the creature didn't decelerate as quickly. Now at 60 miles per hour, I aimed the bus right at it and ran it over as the creature attempted to slow down. And before I could celebrate, I saw a pair of taillights ahead. The taillights brightened as the vehicle slowed down. 
They saw me. And this wasn't anything small, either. It was a semi-truck. The truck slowed all the way down to 20 miles per hour, forcing me to do the same. I knew the driver was planning something, but I still had no idea what was going on. My questions were soon answered, as a bright light was reflected off the left mirror, darting around the front of the bus looking for my eyes. But with the 40-foot trailer behind the truck, this made the precision required for hypnosis incredibly difficult. They quickly realized this wasn't going to work and it stopped. As I followed the truck, we brainstormed ideas on how to defeat the thing, even citing past experiences with large vehicles like this one. But to my right, above the forest, I saw something unnatural. The mansion. It was at least two floors taller than the forest. It was also very large horizontally as well. I didn't know how to describe the building other than saying it reminded me of a woodland mansion from Minecraft, with the way that it was surrounded by the forest and the dimensions. The mansion gave me an idea. Hey guys, are the mansion owners allied with the creature driving the truck? I don't think so, replied Angela. I really see them interacting if they do. It's usually hostile, though they're not as aggressive as they are to us. Oh, good. You're going to make the mansion owners attack the truck, aren't you? I heard Tommy say. Exactly. Well, just get as far away from the truck as you can so they don't see you too, replied Tommy. All right. I turned off my lights once we were about 500 feet away from the mansion. The truck driver looked back at us through the mirror for a few seconds. The light illuminated the cab. As if the driver was trying to say, I know you're still back there, you idiot. As we slowly approached the mansion, I let the bus slow down so I could gain some distance from the truck. I didn't touch the air brakes to avoid being heard by the truck driver. It may have known I was still behind it, but it didn't know how far away I was. Once I was about 200 feet away, the bus was down to 2 miles per hour. I pulled the parking brake, causing the bus to come to a halt silently. The truck was oblivious to what I was doing and it was still going forward, very slowly for some reason. It seemed that it was trying to stall me until reinforcements arrived. We all got our sunglasses to protect our eyes from what was about to happen, ready to put them on at any moment. The moment the truck's light struck the road in front of the mansion, it happened. For the split second, I saw the light at full force. My vision was already being obstructed by spots, as if I had been staring at the sun for several minutes. Even with the sunglasses, it still bothered my eyes to look at it. The light swarmed the truck like bees that had their hive disturbed. While the owners were distracted, I put the bus into reverse and I floored it. The sound of the engine got the attention of the truck driver, but it wasn't able to turn around or reverse very quickly due to the trailer. So, it ended up having to go forward to flee the owners. Now that the truck was gone, I went back into drive and continued down the road, though not very quickly to not catch up with the truck. I slowed down even more so I could get a better look at the now vacant building. The front of the mansion had wooden walls with a concrete base. There is a hole in the front with many equally sized rooms, with one window across the walls. Each room was illuminated by light bulbs on the chandelier. The rooms had a wide variety of contents, some looked natural, some looked weird, and some were disturbing. One room looked like a kitchen, one like a bedroom. One was almost completely filled with a pile of wires. One was a prison cell. One had tens of black cats inside. And one had a floor covered in spikes with doll heads on them. How original. The room full of cats caused me to stop the bus. Why is there a room full of cats? I asked the students. A room full of what? They have cats. Tommy replied, who was in the seat directly behind me. I don't think we've ever gotten a good look at the mansion before. 
This is the first time someone managed to distract the owners. Another student replied. I pulled the parking brake and I got out of my seat. I want to investigate the cat room. I told the students. Go to the window but don't enter the mansion. Just don't. The same student from earlier had replied. And park the bus right next to the window. Angela added. Wait, hold on. What is your name? I asked the anonymous student. Oh, I'm Joseph. Alright, good to know. I then did what Joseph said. I positioned the bus so that the doors were right next to the window of the cat room. I got out and I peered into the room. Cats everywhere, very malnourished and the smell was rough. There was an island literally made of crap in the center. Definitely not okay. I grabbed a rock and I smashed the window several times before the window split in half. I could have used the gun, but I didn't want to waste any bullets or attract any unwanted attention. Tommy, Angela, and two other students came out to help. Once the glass pane had split, we kept hitting it in a concentrated spot until we had created a hole large enough for the cats to get through. As soon as we had pointed this out to them, the cats rushed out to freedom. Whatever they were going to get themselves into in this forest was a better fate than whatever the owners were doing with them in there. The wire room was one room away from the cat room, with the prison cell in between the two. I walked over to investigate. I probably could get a few thousand bucks for all that copper. I pointed out to the students. Will we get any of it? Tommy asked. I'll give you each some for helping me retrieve it but I'll take most of it as compensation for what I had to put up with today. Twenty dollars an hour isn't cutting it. I also had the rest of the students come out to help me with stealing the wire, promising a small portion of what I'm going to get for them. I broke the window with the rock and made a small hole the size of a fist. You know, it would be a lot easier if someone goes inside the mansion and... No! Every student replied at once. Okay, never mind then. We continued at bashing the window until the hole was big enough to climb through. We managed to load all the wires into the bus before the owners returned. Even if they did return before they were done, we had already set up a place to hide. The students then organized the wire once we were already on the road. As I was about to arrive at stop 5, I saw the owners returning from their mission. I quickly put on my sunglasses as I floored the bus and blindly drove through the light. However, the owners were not interested in me, and they continued their journey home. It seems that the enemy attacked those who disturbed them, and somehow driving by their mansion does that. They still had no idea that I had freed their cats and stole their wire, and even when they find out, they'll have no idea who did it. I arrived at stop five a minute later and dismissed Joseph and four other students. This bus stop was similar to stop four, with very similar houses as well. I still had seven students in the bus as I skipped stop two and four. I knew what I had to do. Rule 13. The true end of this road merges with a larger road at a three-way stop. If any students are still in the bus once you've passed all five stops, Go back to the front of the road and try again. Keep doing this until all students have reached their stops, or if you get too tired to continue. I sighed as I left the stop. You know you're going to have to drive down this road again, right? Tommy asked. Yeah, I know. Hey, at least this time you'll be more prepared. And you know that there's a fake bus stop between stops 1 and 2. And you know that the mansion is between stops 4 and 5. This doesn't refresh every time you go down the road, unlike the Rule 3 road and the dead end. Alright, I'll go back and do another round. As I continued down the road, I found the semi-truck or what was left of it. I parked the bus next to the truck to get a better look at it. The truck seemed to have crashed straight into a tree instead of turning for the curve. The trailer's walls were partially melted causing the roof to collapse onto the burning wooden crates inside. The body of the truck was completely destroyed, 
with only the chassis and engine block still being recognizable. In the melty remains of the cab, I saw the charred skeleton of the driver. It's terrifying to think that could have been me. Holy crap, a student muttered. Tommy and I got out of the bus and walked to the side of the truck to further investigate what the heck had happened here. Looking at the vague remains of the truck, I determined that the skeleton was in the bed at the back of the cab. I theorized that the owner's blinding light caused the driver to be unable to see the road and was therefore unaware of the curve. After the crash, the driver hid in the back of the truck in the fetal position as the owners brightened their lights to the point that the heat literally melted the steel body of the truck. This combined with the fuel tanks that were set on fire burned the driver to the point where it was just a skeleton. Are we looting this one too? Tommy asked. I don't think there's anything valuable that's still intact. I'm just investigating what the heck happened here. Look man, I'm just as horrified as you are. I've heard of disappearances relating to the mansion owners, but I've never seen what happened to them. The rules were just updated accordingly. We returned to the bus and continued down the road. I found the end of the road and made a left turn onto Route 3, intending to go back to the beginning of Old Military Road. Not long after I got on the road, I heard a student scream. What the? She was interrupted by her own choking. George, stop the bus now, Tommy instructed, as if I wasn't already doing that. I got out of my seat and looked back to see several students fighting a wire that was strangling the student. The wires had come to life and were crawling around like snakes. We evacuated the bus and I locked the doors hoping that they couldn't unlock them. Once we were outside, I freed the student from the wire that was choking her. I then inspected that wire and saw the copper bending and contorting on its own. The wires were fiddling around in the driver's seat, but they couldn't start the bus because I had the keys. Now what? A student asked. I could call 911, I replied. Man, what are you going to tell them? That we're being attacked by copper snakes? Tommy asked rhetorically. I paused for a moment before I had an idea. I dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? Um, there are these snake things on my bus. I managed to trap them all inside, but I can't get rid of them. And what's your address, sir? I'm on Route 3 near the spot where Old Military Road merges onto the highway. Okay, sir, we have sent animal control to deal with the situation. Can you stay on the line for me? Yeah, I can do. I was interrupted by the engine roaring to life. How? Sir, what is going on? The bus accelerated and drove into a guardrail on the side of the road at an angle and was pushed back onto the road by the guardrail. The bus continued accelerating as fast as it could while scraping against the guardrail to guide it down the highway. My what? The snakes just hijacked the bus. Tommy spoke for me. The operator tried her best to stay professional, but she couldn't avoid letting out a chuckle about how ridiculous this situation was. Okay, we're going to deal with that as well. What direction is the bus going? It's going east, but is scraping against the guardrail to guide it down the road. Alright sir, we've dispatched several units to close the road until the runaway vehicle is stopped. Do you need a ride? Yes ma'am, but there's eight of us. I'm a school bus driver. That's fine. We can dispatch three units to take you to your destination. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. A few minutes later, three police cars arrived. I told the officers to take us back to the bus yard. As we drove down the highway, we found the bus. The wires had figured out how to use the steering wheel, but still had no idea what they were doing. They were swerving all over the road attempting to not scrape against the guardrail. I don't think they had any other perception of reality outside of touch. Multiple police cruisers and even a SWAT truck were chasing the bus at this point. It seemed that police from nearby towns were called in to help with this pursuit. 
Once we had passed the bus, the officer in the vehicle I was in interviewed me as we traveled to our destination. Sir, how did these snakes get into your bus? I was at a bus stop when they somehow snuck in and tried to choke out one of my students. And we had to evacuate the bus so I could free the student from the snake that was strangling her. I partially lied. Why did you and your students evacuate the bus? While I didn't want to be attacked by the snakes as I fought the snake that was strangling one of my students. There were like 50 of them so if I stayed in there, all of us probably would have been strangled to death. We arrived at the bus yard a few minutes later. I thanked the officers and I went to the guard. The officers then turned around and drove back to help pursue the bus. Hey guard, it's me again. The guard paused whatever he was doing on his phone and he studied me for a moment. Oh, hey George, where's the bus? Oh, it was stolen by copper snakes. Yeah, of course they did. These jobs are weird as heck. Wait, you too? Yeah, come in, I want to show you something. The guard unlocked the thick steel door and invited us in. The shack had a desk against the back wall and an office chair facing the table, while also being next to the window on the wall to its left. Above the desk was a wall of six monitors on the back wall, each displaying the input of a camera somewhere in the yard. The desk had a laptop on it in front of two of the monitors, though those monitors can be seen if the laptop is closed. The shack was large enough for all of us to fit inside, though it was still a bit cramped. He picked up the paper I saw him look at when I first got here. Rules for Fredrickson Bus Yard Guarding You must follow these rules when guarding the bus yard. We cannot ensure your safety if you break any of these rules. 1. Only the following people are permitted to enter the bus yard. Ernest Fredrickson Anna Evergreen, Harry Williams, George Redwood. If someone arrives that identifies as someone not on this list, hold them at gunpoint until they leave or you have to shoot them to defend yourself. 2. If a bus or other vehicle in the yard starts its engine for no reason, close the metal shades on the window and wait until it turns off. It may attempt to accelerate, but all buses and vehicles should be in park, so this won't work. Do not, under any circumstances, make your presence known until the engine stops. 3. If one of the monitors starts showing static, smash it with a crowbar that we provided for you if possible. If you are currently experiencing Rule 2 at the same time, unplug the power strip all the monitors are powered by and get as far away from the monitor as you can without exiting the shack. Keep track of which monitor was showing static earlier such as putting a sticky note on it. Once Rule 2 ends, smash the monitor before turning the rest of them back on. 4. At any time a man may show up thinking your shack is a snack bar, give him something to eat or you'll be the snack. If you cannot give him a snack due to Rule 2, call us and continue hiding until we've dealt with the situation. 5. If the sun turns red, don't look at the sky for a prolonged period of time. You won't die, but the red sun will literally destroy your retinas if you look at it for more than a few seconds. The same may happen if you look at the sky, though it'll take a little longer. Both of these are safe to look at through a camera, and pictures taken of the sky or sun cannot harm you, but they can damage the camera similar to how they can damage your eyes. 6. Don't sleep on the job, just don't. If you get too tired to continue your shift, alert us and we'll send someone to take your shift. Only leave once your replacement has arrived. Do not trust your peripheral vision if this happens. 7. If you see a shadow figure roaming the nearby area, pretend that it doesn't exist. Do not let it know it has physically entered our world. 8. At around 3 a.m., your mother may show up and ask you about your job. She'll look like she does in the present, but if she's dead, she'll look like she did shortly before her death. If you're adopted, your biological mother will show up and act like she knows you. If this happens, pretend you don't know her and tell her to get out. After I read it, the students took turns reading the rules for themselves. 
As we were doing this, my bus showed up. It took a while to get it here as it kept hitting those things along the way. The bus was still being chased by several police cruisers and the SWAT truck. We got out of the shack and watched as the wires completely ignored the nearby curve and drove into a tree. They then turned the steering wheel as far right as it could go, before reversing into the same tree again. The bus accelerated forward, swerving all over the place as it drove across the road and right through the fence, only stopping when it struck one of the buses. The wires paused for a moment before they were about to continue their reckless journey. However, the hood was still open from when the engine was disabled by the creatures from Old Military Road. So, one of the officers pulled out a shotgun and shot the engine repeatedly. The most American thing I've ever seen. This actually worked as one of the bullets sliced the serpentine belt, causing the bus to lose several important functions. The wires reversed back onto the road in a straight line, as they no longer had powered steering. It continued driving, but it couldn't do much due to the lack of powered steering, and the engine eventually overheated and stopped right before it struck that same tree again, this time causing it to fall over and collapse onto the roof of the bus. As the wires were trying to figure out what was going on, the officers investigated the bus. The guard, the students, and I got closer now that the bus could no longer run us over. The officer that had interviewed me earlier saw us approach the bus. You call these things snakes? He asked me rhetorically. If I told you my bus was stolen by giant copper worms, you would have not believed me, I replied. Yeah, good point. So now what? I don't know, they seem stuck in there, so we might just leave them in there and tow the bus. I was about to reply when the officer's radio received a message. Philip, an armored truck got on the road and is going westbound towards your location. Sarah, weren't you blocking one of the entrances to the road? Yeah, but the vehicle drove over my car and got on the road. It's that big. I think it's one of those marauders from that Top Gear episode. The rest of the officers were now gathered around Philip to hear what Sarah was saying. I wasn't in the car though. I was telling the driver why the road was closed when he drove over my car right after I told him why. Alright, copy that. Philip ended the call. Yeah, you know what she said. Use your vehicles and the bus to form a barricade. This won't stop the truck, but it'll delay us long enough to open fire on it. The truck eventually showed up, and it was indeed a black marauder. The marauder was being chased by even more police cars. A police helicopter was hovering far above us now. The car barricade would stand no chance against the marauder. The truck stopped. And coming to a halt a few yards from the barricade. Not because the barricade would stop it, but because the driver found what he was looking for. The bus. It was clear that the driver was looking for the wires. Implied by how swiftly he got on the road after Sarah informed him why the road was closed. The officers took one look at the vehicle and knew they were screwed. The helicopter descended and hovered next to the marauder but fled when it started being shot at by a man in the passenger seat. I noticed that it was actually a news helicopter, which explains why it did that. One of the officers called the dispatcher. We're going to need backup. Send in the U.S. military. There's no way we can force the driver to get out. The driver got on the truck's intercom. This is the Red Moth auction hall. One of our clients reported an item stolen. We are here to retrieve it. Another officer grabbed a megaphone from her car to join the amplified shotting match. Sir, that does not justify running over an officer's vehicle and evading the... Yes, it does. You wouldn't understand. While this was happening, a blue 2010s Ford pickup along with a police cruiser escorting it arrived at the bus yard from Riverside Street. The truck drove through the hole created by the bus and stopped beside us and the officer in the police cruiser went to join whatever was happening at the intersection. An old man was inside the truck. Despite his age, he stepped out of the truck with ease. Rough first day, huh? He asked me. The guard and I stared at him in confusion. The students stared at us in confusion, giving us a look that said, Wait, you don't know this guy. 
After an awkward moment of silence, the man identified himself. Oh, I'm Ernest Fredrickson, the dude who hired you. Sorry about that. Not knowing who this guy was, a million questions went through my head. But before I could ask any of those questions, the driver of the Marauder opened his door to throw grenades at the officers. But he made a fatal mistake. Either he didn't notice us standing 20 feet away or he didn't expect us to intervene. This is when I leapt into action. I grabbed the guard's hand and we ran to the truck. Ernest pulled out his firearm and joined us. The driver noticed us and quickly threw the grenades he already activated in advance and he tried to close the door. But before he was able to, I managed to get my left wrist stuck between the door and the wall of the truck, stopping the door from being closed. The driver attempted to repeatedly slam the door on my wrist, hoping that I would remove it because of the pain. But I didn't. While this was happening, the guard in earnest opened fire at the driver. About half the bullets struck the door, but the other half managed to get into the cab. And most of those hit the driver. We ripped the door out of the dead man's grip and I climbed into the truck to unbuckle his seatbelt. So, we could remove the body from the seat. But when I climbed under the seat of the truck... I found another man in the passenger seat, with the exact same attire as the driver, that being what seemed to be a black version of what the US Army wears. I noticed that he had a rifle, so I was forced to shoot him to avoid being shot myself. All of this happened in less than 10 seconds. The grenades the driver threw earlier landed behind the barricade and blew up, injuring several officers. Some of these surviving officers tended to the injured ones, while the rest came over to the marauder to inspect it. The three of us returned to the yard where the kids were. Shortly after the officers had entered the marauder, the back door is opened and eight men rushed out of the truck. They all had the same attire as the two in the front and three of them had briefcases for some reason. Five officers chased them on foot. We all thought this was the end as none of them had any weapons. Or at least we thought. The one with the briefcases stopped for a moment and threw their briefcases at the officers. One of them had managed to strike an officer, knocking him to the ground. But the briefcases had another use other than being a projectile. Because as the officers passed them, they were detonated, causing a massive explosion. Chunks of briefcase were flung outward, functioning as shrapnel. One of them hit Tommy, two hit the girl who was being strangled by the wire earlier, one hit Angela, and two more hit each me and Ernest. Luckily, we all survived with minor injuries. When the smoke cleared up, we saw the scene that lied before us. The marauder suffered very little damage and the bus's body was heavily damaged but still intact, including the windows. The windshield was struck by four briefcase chunks, leaving the spiderweb cracks where they collided with the windshield. The body of the police cars were ripped apart from the force of the explosion, and the fuel tanks were spilling gasoline all over the road. Even the traffic lights at the intersection were bent. Seven ambulances arrived from Riverside Street, intending to treat the officers injured by the grenade explosion, but found far more than they had bargained for. But in a dark twist of irony, this was still enough ambulances to transport the surviving officers to the hospital. Out of the eight men in the back of the Marauder, five of them survived with minor injuries. The other three were dead or seriously injured. All seven of the kids hid in the guard shack as the guard Ernest and I approached the group with our weapons drawn. As soon as they saw us, the healthy ones dropped their injured comrades and fled down Route 3 on foot in the same direction the marauder came from. The three of us chased them and managed to shoot all five of them. We walked back to the yard and saw a man talking with the paramedics. What do you mean? The snack bar is right there. What do you mean it's not open? Crap, they didn't know. Rule number four. At any time a man may show up thinking your shack is a snack bar, give him something to eat or you'll be the snack. If you cannot give him a snack due to rule two, Call us and continue hiding until we've dealt with the situation. We continued approaching the ambulances, but still try not to attract the man's attention. Sir, we're paramedics. We do not have a snack bar. 
The man went from annoyed to angry. His voice became incredibly deep and demonic. Give me a snack right now. The paramedic stared at the man, very confused at what just happened. The man's fingernails grew incredibly quickly, and they transformed into claws in the process. He used his wolverine hands to attack the man, peeling off a thick and large chunk of his forearm. The paramedic ran off and screamed in agony due to being literally skinned alive. The man's fingernails broke off and the man returned to normal. Thanks, have a nice day. He said as if he just bought this chunk of human flesh from a snack bar. He left in the direction he seemed to have come from. Several shadow figures appeared near him and wandered aimlessly. Rule 7. If you see a shadow figure roaming their nearby area, pretend that it doesn't exist. Don't let it know that it has physically entered our world. I walked up to the paramedics to inform them of Rule 7. Luckily, they complied, as they all witnessed what happens if you break Rule 4. The paramedics continued loading the injured officers into the ambulances, with the one that was skinned alive joining them. When a heavy-duty tow truck that was going way too fast for Riverside Street bashed through two of the ambulances that were in its way, while making a sharp right turn into the left lane of Route 3, almost flipping over in the process. This truck was definitely able to tow the bus, and that's exactly what they did. The truck reversed to the bus and two men got out, almost identical to the 10 in the Marauder, and quickly hooked up the bus to the tow cable. The men got back into their truck and sped off in the direction that the truck was facing. This all happened within 15 seconds. The paramedics were about to nope out of there, but the men in the tow truck didn't have time to attack them. Both of the ambulances that were damaged were still drivable. One of the paramedics was injured by the truck's crash, having been ran over by his own ambulance, and had to be transported to the hospital by his co-workers. He is expected to make a full recovery. Out of these 17 officers that were at this war zone, only 7 survived. All five of the officers that were perusing the men were blown to bits due to being so close to the explosion. The three officers were inside of the Marauder at the time of the explosion, and they all survived with virtually no injuries. Seven officers were injured by the grenades. Out of them, four were declared dead at the scene. Two died on the way to the hospital, and only one survived. She is severely injured, but is expected to make a full recovery. Out of the four officers attending to the injured seven, one died at the scene, one was critically injured, and the other two survived with minor injuries as they were behind the bus at the time. The one that was critically injured is also expected to make a full recovery. I don't know where the other six officers were at the time of the explosion, but they all died at the scene. When interviewed, I told them what happened and explained that I said snakes because they wouldn't believe me if I told them the truth. The only difference is that I said a pile of copper wires was next to a bus stop and they invaded the bus. The students all told the same lie. Ernest, the guard and the surviving officers backed up my story saying that there were wires in the bus. None of us were charged with anything. And the three of us that raided the Marauder were praised for our bravery. All ten of the men died at the scene. Their bodies couldn't be identified. The Marauder was impounded by the police. Its license plate revealed that the vehicle was registered under the name Alfred Cornell, with the address being resident somewhere in Maine. When the police went to that location, they found an empty lot in a semi-remote location, with nothing on it other than a brick wall that was 20 feet long. Eight feet tall and one foot wide. The tow truck and my bus were never seen again, for now at least. Ernest tried to track down the bus, but its tracker was disabled somehow. The news station that tried to film the massacre was ordered by the federal government to delete the limited footage they had captured, and to never speak of this until further notice. The rest of us that witnessed the event were essentially given NDAs by the government, the family members of the dead officers were given large settlements. These surviving officers had their medical bills paid for, and they were given a smaller settlement for their troubles. The seven students that didn't make it to their stop were taken care of by Ernest, his wife, and his three middle-aged children until they could be returned home. 
Ernest told me that I wasn't actually being paid $20 an hour. The ad was only listed that way to not attract unwanted attention. I was actually being paid $200 an hour, and he gave me a $1,000 bonus for my troubles today. The guard's wage was also multiplied by 10, and he also got a $1,000 bonus. I told Ernest what actually happened, and we now have a 14th rule for the bus drivers. Rule 14. Do not steal from the mansion owners, because they will find you, and they will do whatever it takes to get their stuff back.